this is the second day. So now we're going to get little by little into the technical stuff. We still feel that it's uh, good to have a small introduction. We know that you're already expert on this part, but you know, something brief about the quantitative genetics. Well, I think Marley did a good job trying to avoid all the you know, nasty formulas and just put it in a very simple <coughs> graphical fashion. So uh, let's go in that topic. Then in the afternoon, we talk about genetic gain, the KPI stuff, and then the, little by little, we build the story. So you know Marley, you know Marley, she's been with us already kind of for a year. Probably you have seen some of her presentations on hybrid breeding, some of her simulations on that topic. Those are very interesting. So Marley, please uh, enlighten us with the Quantum Telegenetics intro, please. <laughs> OK. Good morning. Welcome to day two. Uh, can you hear me OK? Great. Thanks. All right, so like Eduardo said, we're going to start talking a bit about quantitative genetics. Um, I usually like to say that Agnes's presentation on market segments and product profiles yesterday is kind of like planning a destination for your next vacation. <laughs> you need to think about where you want to go and why. And then, um, you know, process management and things like that, you can sort of thinking, think of like getting a car. <laughs> How are you going to get there? And then um, today we're going to be kind of talking about the engine of the car. Um, I would say quantitative genetics and statistics are the engine that will get you where you want to go. So this may get a little bit technical. Um, to be honest, with this group, I'm not so worried about that. I'm actually more worried it's not technical enough. <laughs> um, but I hope you enjoy. And um, just have an opportunity to think in a more relaxed setting about some of these things that are mostly theoretical in our day to day. OK, so I think that all breeding programs pretty much have the same steps. Um, we start by generating variation. We do something to evaluate the variation, and then pick the best variants. And really, as soon as we can pick the best variants, um, we want to be recycling them as new parents to restart that process. But all the while, um, we're continuing that going, we should also export good products. Um, so today will just be about how genetics and statistics can be useful to inform these steps. Um, we'll start by talking about the genetic basis of quantitative trait improvement, um, such as differentiating Mendelian and quantitative traits. Um, we'll discuss how population improvement will lead to product development, but they need to be distinguished. And we'll also go over recurrent selection and why it is that that works so well. Um, after that, we'll go through the breeder's equation. Um, so we'll talk about genetic gain, um, selection intensity, accuracy, variance, and cycle length. And um, we'll conclude that by doing sort of a visual simulation <laughs> of how to use the breeder's equation. Um, again, we have a small group and plenty of time. So feel free to let me know if you have a comment or a question. So it was really not that long ago um, that people realized <clears throat> that genes will affect phenotype. And from the beginning, we've always done this by observing pa patterns of inheritance among relatives. So if you cross a green pea and a yellow pea, in the first generation, you might get all yellow peas. But if you um, cross some more, you might see a green one pop up again. So if I asked any of you how to make a true breeding yellow pea, a simple Mendelian trait, I'm sure you could all tell me how to do that. And very quickly, you would come up with that color P. So these are phenotypes that are qualitative and categorical. Um, they have clear differences among classes. And um, they're usually controlled by one or a few genes. OK? So we're going to refer to these as Mendelian traits. But the beast that we have to deal with is, um, of course, that phenotypes show quantitative and continuous variation. Uh, they might not fall into di discrete classes, um, even if you could put them into discrete classes like small, medium, and large, you would somehow lose information about what's really going on in that trait. Um, I didn't know this, but at first people didn't really know how quantitative traits could even arise from genes. It was widely debated whether quantitative traits had a genetic basis. So that's always kind of interesting. Um, just as a quick example, we have a population of mice here. And the length of their body is a quantitative trait. All right. So what happened is um, it turned out that that continuous quantitative variation 
could be explained because um, it's controlled by many, many genes, um, most of which typically have a relatively small effect, okay? Um, so alleles of each gene that control the trait are gonna have these small effects that could be positive or negative, and then they add up to produce the trait value, all right? And so they can be mixed in many combinations. Um, this general idea of how quantitative traits are formed is called the infinitesimal model of quantitative trait inheritance. Um, and each of those loci that affect the trait we call a quantitative trait locus. And people have put a lot of effort into mapping these and finding them, and that's great. Um, but if you look right here at that population of mice I showed you, um, each of these uh, columns is a genotype for an individual, and each row is a QTL in the population. The blue ones are the good alleles, and the red ones are the bad alleles. <clears throat> Anything in the middle is kind of intermediate. So this trait's only controlled by 100 QTL, but if I asked you how to make bigger mice, how long would it take you to stack all of those good alleles? Even if I gave you perfect information and said, these are the QTL that control the trait. So this is why I think that this, this part is interesting probably for this group, because for maybe the past 20 years, we've kind of been focused, at least in the plant breeding world, on mapping each QTL and making them into this ideal genotype in maybe a really specific way. I think that's kind of been maybe the mindset of how to use genetics in plant breeding. But I'm gonna argue with you today <laughs> that that's really not the only way. And there are other ways that we could concentrate the blue favorable alleles here, uh, which is by recurrent selection, okay? So how are we gonna breed these quantitative traits? There are so many genes. Um, since there are too many to identify and stack one by one, uh, we have to consider them all at the same time out of the things that we have. So we're gonna concentrate those favorable alleles and also reduce the frequency of unfavorable alleles in the population um, by recurrent selection. And all the while we do that, we're gonna pick out the best varieties of what's available to develop products. And I'm going to try to demonstrate why um, you'll expect to get good products out of a recurrent selection scheme of our basic breeding program um, and which part is the population improvement, again by recurrent selection, compared to the product development. So we often mention that you're going to want to distinguish population improvement from product development. I'm sure you've all heard that several times. Um, and it's not that they're totally separated, right? Because your, your population improvement occurs, occurs within this. Um, but you don't want to be just trying to export products constantly without having a solid foundation of um, increasing the mean of your population, okay? Um, so I think that recurrent selection is underappreciated. Um, I think if someone discovered it today and wrote a paper, they could easily be like, this is my optimal concentration of allele frequency, like, you know, it would be something really cool. But I think a way to show that is to do a simulation. Um, so let's look at how genotype, phenotype, and population mean value will change in response to a recurrent selection scheme. And by the way, um, everything in this is completely to scale. Um, the allelic effects were drawn out of our simulation software, so it's, it's a representation of what we do behind the scenes um, when we run your breeding simulations. So here, we're gonna generate a population of 20 diploid individuals and their size is a quantitative phenotype. And it's gonna be controlled by 200 QTL, which are spread across 10 chromosomes. We're gonna select the five largest individuals for each cycle and make 10 random crosses with two progeny apiece, okay? So simple breeding scheme. And then we're gonna restart that cycle with a new generation of 20 progeny, okay? And um, along with tracking their phenotypes for each generation, we're going to track their genotypes, and those are in rows, and the individuals are again in columns, just like that mouse population. The blue alleles have more positive effects, and the red alleles have more negative effects. So um, if you are looking at a good individual, you expect it to have a lot of blue in its column, okay? So let's see what kind of changes we observe here. Like I said, here's our breeding population. Down here, we're gonna track the population mean in response to selection. So this is the current distribution of these phenotypes. And um, I'm gonna keep a line here so we remember where we started. And we'll also track the mean of each generation. 
And then over here we have um, yeah, that, that populum, the population genome, um, where the individuals are in the columns and the genotypes are in the row. So let's do our first cycle of selection. Okay, I would say that these dots got a little bit larger. I think I'm right because I see that um, from our starting population in red, we shifted a little bit to the blue. And when I look at the genetics here, um, I'd actually say there's, it's really hard to tell the difference, right? Not, nothing much happening yet. So let's go another cycle. Oh, they increase again. I'm starting to see some of those favorable blue alleles getting fixed in the population. Uh, maybe the population overall looks slightly bluer to you. It doesn't really to me. I'm not seeing that yet. So let's go on. We're going to do this for 30 cycles. So at this point, um, we've seen some changes in this population in response to recurrent selection. Phenotypes are looking good. They're a lot bigger. That was what we wanted. But what I want you to see is what was underlying that. Is everything perfect about this population? I don't think so. Um, we do see a lot of the blue favorable alleles being fixed. So that's great. That is our goal of recurrent selec selection, to fix every favorable allelic state. In some situations, you don't have a favorable allele. You have a favorable genotype if dominance gets involved. But we're not going to deal with that right now. Um, but what I want you to see, too, is that actually some of the negative alleles got fixed in this population. And that's genetic drift. Okay? Uh, that's inbreeding. Um, and so in some ways, we haven't really reached the full potential of this population um, and so forth. But nonetheless, we very effectively increased the population mean. Right? So that's really the fundamentals of how recurrent selection works. Um, I think I'll go through that just one more time, just so you can watch it and um, not hear me talking too much or anything. Let's just run that simulation again. So let's go back again and run it without doing recurrent selection and see what happens. So think to yourself, what are you expecting to happen without using recurrent selection? If we just use the same crosses repeatedly and try to identify some exceptional individuals each time, do you think that the genotypes are going to have that nice increase in the blue alleles? Do you think that the phenotypes are going to increase the way that we saw them? Do you think the means are going to change? So here's cycle one. Um, this is the exact population we started with in the other one. And let's just see. Well, in this cycle, I think this one's pretty big. Like, that looks like it was bigger than the other ones there. So that's nice. Um, that was maybe five cycles. I got something better than what I had before. But if I keep going to those 30 that we did previously, uh, something is not right, OK? We keep looking for a big dot here to select but um, we're not seeing that steady increase in size that we saw with recurrent selection, right? And that's reflected also in the genotypes. They're not being driven in any direction because we're making the same crosses again and again. It's reflected in the population um, because the mean's not moving up. And uh, yeah, that's why we need to do recurrent selection. <laughs> OK? Is that all right? Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you're just crossing the same individuals, is that what you're doing? Exactly. Okay, so you don't change your parental population? No, at not at all, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so we know that not everyone is doing that anymore these days, but, um, you know, I think with a QTL mapping mindset. <laughs> yeah? Some are doing recurrent selection. Yeah. Um, John Mice was doing a recurrent yeah. selection on Bracaria. So there's, there's quite a few people doing recurrent selection. Yes, great. Starting for the very quickly. Yeah. I think uh, we're referring mostly that there's still few that, that don't do it. 
right? Because you see that, for example, the, the banana program is keep using the same parents. Could we maybe use the microphones, please? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So actually, that's our hope, right? That everyone uses recurrent selection because we still have a couple of programs that, for some issues, maybe logistical, biological, they just keep using the same parents, and they have, of course, observed these patterns because I mean, they're, these are obvious, right? But we just kind of trying to start with the obvious things to to build up the story. But yeah. program is kind of hybrid in this sense because of the uh, biology and I think we should make a change but I don't know which one yet because it's half recurrent selection half recycling the same parent and I think I'm seeing some of that thanks yeah anybody else thoughts on recurrent selection yeah, I, I will say, I mean, I think there are times where there are real biological constraints, like uh -huh. people know it might work, but yeah, there's a constraint. But in a different generation too, I think, um, sorry Shafi, um, there was kind of a mindset of stacking QTL to make the ultimate genotype, or focus only, focusing only on the product, and continually, continually back-crossing new QTL into that product. And that's kind of what we want to disrupt a bit. Shafi, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I think... Uh yeah, so uh, there, um, so, uh, I believe we all, we, uh, we all agree, so this recurrent selection should be used and uh, it's, uh, it's powerful. So in reality, um, it might be not to use the, that, uh, uh, that, I mean, that, that much or is, is not completely follow this, this pattern for every cycle you select the new, par new parents and uh, so um, I think there, there, so there are some concerns mainly about the multiple traits the breeding program deal with, especially for some disease traits. So we don't have powerful screen method to screen for that. So we are not sure our new, new best material have that, that traits or not. So I think this is something it, we, 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 we need to improve is mainly about phenotyping the different traits and then we can implement this, uh, uh, I mean, fully implement this, this recurrent selection. So that's a, that's a Sure, yeah. And I, I agree with you too that there's a place for introducing simple traits um, if, if the disease resistance you're mentioning is um, maybe in a separate introgression pipeline. Um, but yeah, as, as long as this fundamental part is in place, um, you can add those in too. But yeah. All right, I'm glad this, yeah, you all seem mostly to be using recurrent selection already. So yeah, not a problem. It's kind of, it's a nice chance to sit back and see what's going on under the hood. Um, so yeah, uh, the other thing is that if you aren't using this, it is really hard to extract products. If your goal is to increase the value of your product, like increase the literal value, um, it's going to be really hard to get products out of that population again and again without concentrating those alleles. It's not enough to add in new alleles. It's really about concentrating them, OK? Um, but with recurrent selection, um, the other thing we like to say is that you're, you're really likely to get a good product out of that. And that's even like independent to some extent of your evaluation strategy of those products. I'm not saying that's not important, but if you look, remember how that population started to look after maybe 10 cycles, you actually couldn't have found a bad thing compared to the first generation in those materials because the population mean had changed. And you, know, you still need to make an effort to find the best thing in that population, but you can't get back to cycle zero if you wanted to. <laughs> Um, so this is just a little bit more of a formal way to show that. Um, it was the probability that an individual superior to all others could be identified out of every cycle of selection during population improvement. So if you're not using recurrent selection, you, you can identify a good product a couple of times. And this is in a closed population, so it assumes you're not crossing in QTL or anything like that. But after, um, 
about five attempts, your probability of getting anything better out of that same old distribution is next to nothing, okay? In contrast, um, if you're selecting with any degree of accuracy, um, the probability of getting something good uh, remains more constant and um, increases with that accuracy. So assuming we all want to do recurrent selection, let's do a brief review of the factors that affect a trait's response to that recurrent selection, okay? So these are obviously summarized in the breeder's equation, um, which again, I'm sure you've all seen in classes and you're all pretty familiar with, um, but I think the breeder's equation is something that can seem so simple. Even for our, our biometricians, they're probably like, yeah, this is, this is an equation I can handle. Um, that for me, it's always been hard to think through the consequences of each of those factors and what they mean in something as complex as a breeding program. Okay, so the breeder's equation can predict the change in mean genetic value of a quantitative trait within a population. Um, and for it to do that, we need to give it information about selection and the population in a single breeding cycle. Um, so the equation is that your expected genetic gain which is sometimes pronounced delta G, you might also see it called R, is equal to your selection intensity um, times your selection accuracy times the genetic standard deviation in your population, and all that over the cycle length. Um, there are other formulations of this. Uh, you can include cost. Um, there are other formulas for specific instances. But uh, this is, in general, what we need to do during selection. So pretty clearly, to increase genetic gain, which we presumably want, we want to increase the things on the top and decrease the one on the bottom. So the big thing here is you want to decrease cycle length, right? Okay, that's the only thing on the bottom. And then um, I think it's probably not controversial to say we would all like to increase accuracy or something like that. Um, another thing to think about is that the breeder's equation really does apply to every species with a quantitative trait. Um, there are particular features of species, like the age at which plants flower, or um, how quickly you can replicate or multiply your genotypes that will influence the optimal design of your breeding pipeline. But those don't really change how quantitative traits behave at the end of the day. Um, so let's just really quickly go through each term of the equation in detail. Um, I know this is a refresher, so um, bear with me if you need to. Um, starting with genetic gain. Um, genetic gain, I would say, can sometimes be mischaracterized. So I'd like to be real specific that genetic gain is the amount of change in mean genetic value of a population over time. Okay? It must be due to selection over breeding cycles, and it always occurs within a population. So it's not the difference between a variety and a check. And the big reason for that is that the varieties and checks don't always have clear genetic relationships that let us use the amount of that difference in a selection program or something like that. Like I said before, you can also call this response to selection, in which case it's going to be written R. Um, so expected genetic gain can be calculated from the breeder's equation. Um, there are probably more sophisticated methods as well. And then, you, besides your expectation, you have a realized genetic gain. And that can be different from your expectation. Um, and it must be estimated from observations. So Eduardo will give a session in the afternoon about how to estimate genetic gain. And then the rate of genetic gain is your average change in mean genetic value per cycle, OK? So the mean genetic value of the population is the mean. Uh, the genetic gain is between two time points, and then the rate of genetic gain is just the average over those time points. So um, if we just do a quick simulation again, looking at genetic gain, on the x-axis you have your breeding cycles from 0 to 30, and um, on the y-axis you have the population mean genetic value, the true one. Um, and we do a, a, some kind of selection program. So um, from cycle one to two, um, the mean genetic value of this population increased um, from 2.7 units to 3.7. So the amount of genetic, genetic gain was one unit. Based on these two time points, the rate of genetic gain is one unit per cycle. Okay, so that's why it's the rate um, compared to just the amount. We could also um, 
calculate or estimate genetic gain at other time points, and then the amount would, of course, change because from cycle one to 10, the difference um, in that was, you could probably fill this in, think it through for a minute, how you would calculate this. I'm not gonna do it in my head. <laughs> um, so 8.6 minus 2.7, you have a genetic gain of 5.9 units. And then um, if I asked you for the rate of genetic gain, just based on these two time points, um, knowing that the difference is nine cycles, you'd have 5.9 units over nine cycles, so around 0.6 units per cycle. So your rate of genetic gain can change depending on where you are in the process. Um, some of you may also be seeing um, it might not be linear. It's typically not linear. So some of you could probably get a better estimate of this rate than I did right here. So that's genetic gain. Um, one of the things we wanna increase to get uh, increased genetic gain is selection intensity. Um, so this is the selection differential divided by the phenotypic standard deviation. Um, the selection differential, S, is the phenotypic deviation of each of your selected individuals from the overall population mean of stuff that's selected or not selected. And then we divide that by the number of the selected individuals and then divide that whole thing to get intensity by the phenotypic standard deviation, all right? Um, so selection intensity is pretty closely tied to like the percentage of individuals you select, okay? Especially for normally distributed traits, but it's not exactly the same and I'll, I'll show you why in the next slide. But all you really need to remember if you're in a pinch is it's most important to just know that selection intensity will capture the difference between the selected parents and the overall population. So here's my overall population. Where are my selected parents? Are they in this part of the population? Are they not that much better? So on and so forth. As a quick example, um, over here is a population of 20 plants. Um, they have a mean phenotype of a half a meter for height. It's their phenotypic standard deviation is 0.2 meters. So on average, these individuals are 0.2 meters from the mean. Um, so let's go ahead and select the top three. Um, these ones right here. Their phenotypes are 1, 0.9, and 0.8. So next we need to get their deviation from the population mean. So each of these we subtract 0.5. And then we add those up and divide by the numbers of individuals that we have. Um, to get a selection differential of 0.4 meters. Um, you might be wondering, why, why don't we just report the selection differential? Why does it need to be divided by that phenotypic standard deviation? Um, and that's because that'll make it comparable across traits at different scales. So that makes your intensity interpretable across programs, traits, and so forth, and puts it on a common gram. So in this case, if we take the differential of 0.4, divided by our phenotypic standard deviation of 0.2, your selection intensity is two. And um, that's, that's the number that needs to go into the equation to make the units match and everything. Um, I think I mentioned selection intensity is gonna be a little different from the percentage of individuals you select. Um, and this is fundamentally arising because intensity is about sampling out of a distribution, okay? Um, so because at the tail of this distribution, um, no matter how many individuals you have, how many literal individuals you have are there, um, the distribution doesn't really change its shape that much. So you are gonna, um, yeah, uh, you might have a lot more individuals selected without really changing your intensity. Um, so let's look at the table to see that more clearly. If we select like 20% of individuals out of a normal distribution right here, um, your selection intensity is like 1.4. But if you have your percentage selected to 10, your intensity is 1.7. So it doesn't, it's not that it doubles, okay? Um, and this actually has really important ramifications when it comes to breeding program sizes, which is what Dorcas is gonna talk about. Because um, you may have always heard that, you know, breeding is a numbers game and bigger is better. But I would say that when it comes to intensity, what we're really trying to do is sample a distribution and get some good individuals out of it. And to sample a distribution, you don't need an infinitely large population. You just need a reasonable size. 
So that's why it's important to think about selection intensity, not as just being the number of individuals that you select. Now we'll move on to selection accuracy, um, again, as a factor that affects the response to selection. So selection accuracy is just measured as the Pearson correlation, R, of measured values and true values in your selected units. Um, so we all know phenotypes are not perfect. They're not a perfect measure of value. And even our other good estimates of value are not perfect. Um, so accuracy just shows us how far our observations are from the true values on average, all right? Like all correlations, this is gonna be a value ranging from negative one to one. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not special in other, any other way statistically, I would say. As a quick example, um, you can see our observations here and our true values here. Um, in this case, we have a plant that looks really big, but it accidentally receives some extra fertilizer. If we knew the truth without the extra fertilizer, the plant would have looked like this. So there's a pretty marked difference. This plant right here looks pretty average, but it actually received a little bit less fertilizer than the others. So if it had the correct amount, it would have looked like this. There's not much difference, so there's higher accuracy. So anytime you see a higher accuracy, you can think of that as being more reflective of your true value. Um, so like I mentioned, it's always the correlation of an estimated and a true value. Um, so in simulation, we're often going to measure this as the correlation of your phenotype with your true genetic value, because in simulation, we have an idea of what those true values are. But in practice, um, an easy, quick way to think about accuracy with something you measure all the time is um, as the square root of your broad sense heritability in a balanced trial. This only applies to balanced trials, and there are more sophisticated ways to do this if you have missing data, um, which you can always reach out to us about. So down here um, on the x-axis, I'm showing um, a bunch of true values, true genotypic values. And on the y-axis are phenotypes at high versus low heritability. If I look at the correlation of these true values, these phenotypes at high heritability, I can see the phenotypes are very well clustered to the true values. Um, and yeah, the correlation is nearly that square root. It's a little different because it's simulation. But as the um, broad sense heritability decreases, our phenotypes start to deviate more from those true values. We start seeing these plots looking messier. Um, and my selection accuracy would also decline. OK? So in a pinch, um, accuracy can be thought of as like the heritability. Um, genetic standard deviation and variance. This, um, I think, is a key thing to clear up because um, the genetic standard deviation is just the standard deviation of all of your genetic values in the population, okay? It's the square root of your genetic variance. Um, if you don't have non-genetic effects like error in the environment, um, your genetic variance would be equal to your phenotypic variance. I think that because there's always that black box of the markers and things like that, maybe sometimes we feel like genetic variance comes from somewhere besides the phenotypes. But that's not true. <laughs> if you had perfect measures, genetic variance would be phenotypic variance. It doesn't come from anywhere else. The other really key thing is that genetic variance is not the same as a genetic variation. This is a really annoying language thing. Okay, so genetic variance is distinct from nucleotide variation. It's really distinct from diversity, and I'm gonna show you why. Just as a quick visual, um, here's a population that has a mean genetic value of a half a meter, again, and its genetic variance is um, 0.09 meters squared. So we look at those phenotypes, they have a nice spread. And here's a population that also has a mean genetic value of a half a meter. So these have the same mean genetic values, so they're a similar sort of population, but this one has a much lower genetic variance. Which of these would you rather select out of, given that the means are equal? Which of these would probably get you something better? This one with high genetic variance, right? There are definitely bigger things here than in here. Um, and you'll often hear that concept uh, in an idea called usefulness, okay? So we can sometimes predict the usefulness of a cross but that's really mostly just another word for predicting the mean and the variance of the cross. But that, applying that in your program can maybe, if, 
if accurate, help you get um, crosses that are going to produce things that are more like this. So I want to go back to that concept that genetic variance is not the same as genetic variation. Because um, maybe not in this room, but sometimes we do have the conception that increasing diversity in your program, like nucleotide diversity, is an important way to increase mean genetic value for a quantitative trait. Um, so this is just what I said before, but I want to give you an example of a diversity panel, okay? I can't count how many papers I've seen about diversity panels and what you're going to do with them in terms of breeding. Um, you can have a diversity panel that has very little genetic variance apparent for a trait that's under stabilizing selection, okay? You draw a bunch of genotypes from a natural environment. Um, there's a lot of genetic variation in there, but for whatever reason, um, individuals with anything deviating from some sort of optimal value are not apparent in your diversity panel, um, which is probably pretty common. Um, and then you don't see genetic variance for that, but then as you start to select, you see that cryptic genetic variation that will lead you to be able to change the mean value of that population, all right? Um, so it's, it's really not necessarily true that um, high variation implies high variance and so forth. Let's make that a little less abstract. Um, here's a group of broccoli genotypes that don't really have a ton of genetic variation but they really have a lot of variance for biomass, right? And these, on the other hand, might be very genetically diverse, but with, um, sorry, very genetically diverse, but with uh, very little genetic variance for biomass. So as you have a population and you're applying selection to it, directional selection, you could have more genetic variance even as you redu reduce the uh, variation in that population. Um, if you think of the whole population over time. Um, so long story short, um, when we start to think about genetic variance in populations, let's not equate that with necessarily adding diversity randomly. Uh, it needs to be diversity that's meaningful, and then on top of that, um, it needs to be diversity with a, a high mean value. And Dorcas will go into great detail about that, I think, tomorrow, Thursday. Yes. Thursday. <laughs> Okay, this is the last factor, and then um, we'll, we'll see where we are. So cycle length, I think, can be a bit confusing because we have obviously a product cycle length, but right now I want to talk about the population improvement cycle length. Um, it's just the amount of time that a single breeding cycle takes, all right? So that breeding cycle begins with generating variation, like we saw in the first slide, and it ends when you recycle the parents. Um, so, just like those steps we were seeing before, uh, we need to recycle the best variants. You can think of cycle length as the time from when a selected parent is first born to when it reproduces, okay? The time from when it's born to when it has its progeny. It can also be called um, the generation interval, um, or the average age of parents at their progeny birth, okay? If you have parents that are reproducing at different times. Quick example, um, we have a pipeline here, a clonal breeding program of eight years. It starts with crossing. So parents enter the crossing block at the beginning of year one right here. They go through a couple stages of increases, evaluation, and then right here at year four, we feel ready to recycle into the crossing block at the end of year four. So we'd consider the cycle length to probably be four years, all right? Um, new parents are already four years old when they enter the crossing block again. Whether this is um, four or three can kind of depend on when they flower and whether you have a separate crossing block, so don't, don't be tripped up by that. <laughs> uh, just do it in a consistent way. And do keep an eye out and notice it takes eight years to fully develop a product, the product in this pipeline. Um, but as you all know, you don't have to wait for your product to be finished before you can recycle. You can have the population improvement moving faster than the product development. And we'll show you why that is. So that is the breeder's equation. And again, it looks simple, but if we think about it in our day-to-day, -day, um, I think it becomes more interesting. This is just a little cheat sheet about um, what kind of values you expect for each of these measures. Um, and I think the final point we need to make here is to think about how we're going to change aspects of our program to increase the parts of the breeder's equation that we want, 
um, and you know, genetic gain, intensity, accuracy, sort of a genetic standard deviation. Um, and see if by increasing one or another thing, uh, we can have compensation, all right? So um, right here, we have expected genetic gain um, out of a population that say has um, an intensity of 0.2, an accuracy of 0.75, and um, a genetic standard deviation of 10. And this has a cycle length of four, okay? So the accuracy is pretty high here, 0.75. The expected gain we would get out of that population is about 0.38. Now, if we look over here at a different population, um, they have the same intensity, the same genetic standard deviation, but it actually has lower accuracy. It's only 0.38. But the cycle length is two in this population. You end up with the exact same expected response to selection, okay? So this can be kind of a uh, alarming <laughs> how low your accuracy can get uh, when you still have good, good uh, response to selection. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if that clock is working. I'm wondering how much time we have left. <laughs> okay, so we have till nine. So we have plenty of time. Thanks, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so yeah, let's sum all this up and do another more visual simulation, okay? Um, so you've defined the breeder's equation mathematically. You can refer to that or anywhere else. Um, but let's picture what it's like to really use it, okay? Um, so in this simulation, we're going to assume we have perfect measures of these flower genotypes and phenotypes, and they're in a constant environment. All right, so this is our flower breeding, flower breeding program. Um, down here, the numbers are the value of this phenotype, big and small. Um, a good allele has a value of two, a bad one has a value of zero, and blue versus pink. For simplicity, we're going to ignore the heterozygotes. <laughs> Um, and our goal is to make bigger flowers. So when I first made this, I was talking to Eduardo, and he was like, well, I would really prefer smaller flowers. So I had to specify <laughs> which, one, which one would be better. Um, all right. So if you're breeding for biomass, uh, positive biomass, which of these plants would you choose as the best variety? Yeah, I think everyone would have just choose the one with the maximum value. Great, great work. <laughs> and uh, the nice thing is we can see that underlying that are a bunch of positive alleles all stacked together. Now, which of these plants would you select as the best parents? I think that it's still pretty clear that we would select the best individuals, right? But there's some value to including the second parent even though it has a lower value. What would you say that, why, why don't we just pick this one? when we're going to select as new parents in our population. If you look at the genotypes, and you'd never know this in real life, right? But the reason that, well, not never, but you wouldn't know it in this case. Um, the reason that we benefit by having two of these parents is that um, if we only select this one, we actually can't really make any additional gain, right? Because we have these negative alleles fixed. But um, by increasing the number of parents who are doing something, we have that potential to make gain in the next generation, okay? Now we're gonna go ahead and cross those parents we selected and phenotype their progeny. Again, ignoring heterozygotes, um, we just kind of pick some of these and, and throw them into a new genotype. Um, like I said, since we kept this individual that had that good allele, um, we have a better possible genotype um, all of these genotypes are, on average, better than the mean from this population, right? You already know that. We've seen that a few times. Um, but yeah, there we go. It's all good. If we'd selected more parents and had lower intensity, um, would that have been worth that trade-off? We were saying that by selecting two parents, 
we increase the genetic potential in our population sort of by um, avoiding fixation of those alleles we don't want. But is it worth including this one as well, given that you have perfect information about the genotypes? No, it's not. It's contributing, you know, more variants, but they're not good variants, right? And it's going to decrease the mean of your next generation if you include it, okay? So there's kind of this balancing act between selecting too many, selecting too few, which again, Dorcas will be discussing. Um, if the genetic standard deviation of the population were lower, um, you know, maybe we wouldn't have that individual, that second individual with that nice value or something like that, um, that could reduce gain. Um, if you had lower accuracy, I don't know, maybe you send your student to the field and they're like, yeah, I, I took the measurements from the side of the road <laughs> and I called it good. Um, no, I'm kidding, I know your students would never do that. Um, of course, we would pretty much just be selecting randomly. Um, so we need to have good accuracy. And then um, finally, what if we could cross and phenotype faster? So this would be a way of reducing cycle length. Um, to make this really clear, uh, we could have our parents cross them to make the progeny, and then again, cross them to make more progeny. These are conveniently perfect already after two cycles of selection. <laughs> um, if that takes a year each time you do it, that just takes longer than if it were to somehow take a month. Okay, so we'll talk more about um, reducing cycle length later. So yeah, I hope that you are tired now of hearing about the breeder's equation. Uh, you've, you've heard it to death. Um, I do want to remind you that the breeder's equation is sort of just a framework to think about um, your breeding program. Um, it actually has some important assumptions and limitations. One is that your selection, evaluation, and recombination units are all the same, okay? So if you're in a line breeding program with inbreeding, that's probably not the case. Um, it assumes that selection is done in one stage. Um, it assumes generations don't overlap. And it also assumes your selected population is pretty large. Um, so in practice, for example, this one um, means that the breeder's equation doesn't really take into account effects of inbreeding, um, that reduction, potential reduction of genetic variance. Um, but that's, that's okay. Um, these things are not always true. They shouldn't always be true. Um, and if you want a more uh, complex or realistic valuation, we can do that by simulation. That's why we do simulations for you. Um, so yeah. That, nonetheless, it's always nice to have something simple to go back to um, and to rely on. So these are four factors which can increase or decrease the rate of genetic gain in your population. Um, they're not all equally easy or inexpensive to change or manipulate, and we'll talk about which ones are. Um, the factors do tend to interact. There are often trade-offs among them in practice, which we'll look at. Um, and of course, the breeder's equation it's just something to predict, you know, simply in, into one future, one future cycle. So um, you, in practice, will want to think more about how your decisions compound over time to change response to selection or your population. And yeah, we can always do that by simulation. So yeah, um, that's just a quick overview for the things that we'll be talking about later that we'll want to rely on. Uh, we'll talk about breeding strategies, um, the optimal number of individuals to use as parents and program size, um, METs, G by E, and TPE sampling, um, selection methods and units, and um, other, other aspects here as well. But you can find them in your agenda. So I think we have plenty of time for discussion. Um, please keep me on track. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, Edward. All right, if there is any thoughts, questions, comments, you just want to share something with the rest of the audience, please go ahead. It seems like someone went to reporters that went to use the, <laughs> the mask. Um, so you can please wear your mask. Oh, it was Roberto. He went out. He went to tell the people that uh, we need to wear the mask. <laughs> I just hear Roberto just saying that they told us that we need to wear the mask. Um, so if you need a mask, uh, Rosalva is around. 
Um, all right, so uh, like we said, I mean, we just wanted to provide a quick intro to some of the concepts. We still have to go over the topic of transmitting value. Um, I think particularly, you know, the, the idea on the genetic variance and genetic variation is something valuable that we not always consider. Uh, you know, in general, if you have any questions, thoughts, go ahead. Otherwise, uh, Marley will, yeah, please, Shafé. You have a microphone with you? Yeah, I have. Uh, my question is about uh, the components in the breeder's equation. So is um, the genetic standard uh, division or is uh, additive uh, standard division? So probably for inbred crop, there is no dominant effect. If the epistatic effect is very small, probably that, uh, that works. But for heterozygous progenitors, um, we might need to focus on additive, right? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We're going to talk about it more in the next section. So actually, the type of genetic variance you exploit will depend on your selection strategy. And I think we should just go into that into a bit more detail later. Um, you may have heard classically that only additive genetic variance is transmissible. And you can really only increase the additive value of populations. And we'll talk about why that is. But actually, that's, not, um, that's kind of an oversimplification. Um, there are ways to transmit or increase dominance value, and we'll talk about what they are. Um, another key thing to think about, just thinking about what you said, is um, when it comes to inbred genotypes, it's true they don't have a lot of dominance or epistasis, or you know, no dominance in the product, of course. But um, they may have low levels of dominance that at early stages of the breeding program are still, you know, as they segregate, yeah, you need to pay attention to. But yeah, let's talk about how to use additive versus dominance variants um, in the future. But Marley, I would suggest that you're the only one that maybe doesn't have to wear the mask. <laughs> because you as the presenter, <laughs> you're the only person that we need to hear. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, guys. But, but, but yeah, just to clear, uh, add on, on top of what Marley said, uh, indeed, I think let's leave it like uh, generic standard deviation, Shafei, okay. because depending on the strategy, you can focus completely on increasing dominance variance, and then the additive doesn't have any value under those strategies. Or you can just go completely additive, or you can increase both. It depends on the strategy. But it's, that is a long... Uh -huh. Based on the genomic information we have, we, may, we can manage, we can, we can deliver not only additive, but also exactly. the other to the progeny, right? Yeah, I think yeah. that's one of the ideas that, you know, are the old days ideas which were true in that moment, but yeah. not necessarily true anymore. Uh, I think Boja had a comment or question. Excellent, thank you. I think I can open it. <laughs> um, it it's not a question, but uh, normally in, in CZ breeding programs, you know, in traditionally, the breeders um, used to claim that um, the CZ, we, we deliver, um, we don't deliver the finished product, right? So we just deliver the germplasm. So it's, it's important to maintain the diversity. So I think there's a misconception about diversity. Um, and then they, want, they tend to cross, you know, make thousands of crosses all the time, you know, pulling lines from here and there. It's not a closed system. So how can we convince those breeders that we are not losing the diversity? Instead, we are increasing because if we create different pipelines, maybe there is genetic divergence. Uh, divergence among those, right? Or the argument that, okay, if we do this way, you know, design different pipelines targeted to different market segments, still we'll have the same amount of genetic diversity as we have in the centralized building program. Yeah, no, that, that's been such an interesting uh, question in the CG. Like, is our role to deliver germplasm or is our role to deliver yeah, improve things. And I don't think there's really a, a conflict there. Um, because that idea that we need to have 
diversity in the population so that each market segment gets their needs met, uh, needs met. each market segment um, has a different target, not a different target population environment, but maybe has different needs in that regard. Um, so that's not really diversity in the sense of genetic diversity. I think it's more about leaving enough material that they can select out of it. But um, yeah, Eduardo, what do you think there? Yeah. Yeah, as much as I would like to answer that uh, question right now, we have an entire session on dealing with genetic variants and, and some of those arguments, right? <laughs> so let's just maybe keep that question for, for, for tomorrow, but yeah, sorry for that. But I think that's one of the uh, most interesting questions that probably the CG people asked, and, and, and I hope that some of the things that we found will help with the discussion, and, and I hope the rest will come from, from your experience and people from other breed, I mean, other breeders' experience. Uh, but yeah, is that uh, okay, Boja? Yeah, definitely, I agree with you, Eduardo, because the concept of population improvement is not there. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to convince because the progress, the impact that we have seen, especially, you know, I'm, I'm referring to wheat program, the impact out there, you know, there is growth, um, there is re realized gain, of course, and that is coming through the, the, I don't know, some, some outlier lines that, that they receive out of the international nurseries or trials. For example, I recently analyzed the data, the historical data in Ethiopia, okay, because the Ethiopian environment and Mexican environment totally are different. There are some negative genetic correlation, you know, most of, most of the places. Uh, but still, over the last 10 years, if you look at the production in, in Ethiopia, the wheat production is going, going high. And there are different other factors, agronomy and investment, you know, the economy is growing. But at the same time, the genetics is also there, contributing in some extent. And what we realize, you know, we, we send the international nurseries, you know, there are different nurseries, and they, um, they ask for all the nurseries, you know, rainfed nurseries, irrigate, everything, and they sample it. You know, they screen from, you know, so different D's and all those things. They sample a few of them, and it's still defined, you know. Some, 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 some lines that can be released as variety, and they are making some progress. But population-wise, there is a negative trend, in fact, over, over the years, you know, or almost zero uh, genetic gain, if you look at all the, all the interests together. So something, I think we need to convince this kind of thing to the builders, you know, we need to move, you know, a bit differently. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this afternoon we're gonna see some of the results on genetic gain from the different crops. And I think that's where we will see that for some places, of course, the genetic gain was positive in the case of wheat. For some, it was pretty much flat or, or, or negative. And that's where you can argue, hey, you've been, say, you've been saying that you're doing population improvement, but actually it seems like, at least for this region, that is not reflected. Um, so yeah, let's come to that uh, discussion between the afternoon of today and, and tomorrow morning with Dorcas. Uh, but yeah. But can I also please yeah, quickly... Please jump in and ask a question. I think, Boja, the most important question you asked is, how are we going to convince the breeders? Um, I guess we've been preaching over the last, I don't know, one and a half, two years, that running out of variation or genetic variance or genetic standard deviation, um, again, you see I'm still not using the right terms immediately, um, is not going to be a short to even midterm issue for us at the moment, um, but there has been this misconception that if we select a bit too, well, too aggressively, too strictly, we're going, we're going to run out of genetic variation, so we maintain genetic variation, and as a result, we're not going to make any genetic gain. Um, I think this message has arrived now with all the breeders we're working with, but um, I can't answer the question how we convince the breeders. You are the breeders and you need to let us know. We don't need to answer that question now because as we have said now, we're going to come to that session. Um, but it would be great to hear from you guys what was, well, the information that hopefully helped us to change your mind and what was the key, the key triggers that made you realize that this is not the key issue um, so we can well, work on delivering that message to those who haven't heard it yet, and we can work together on letting the breeders know that this is not an, a risk at the moment. Yeah, just, just want to, you know, uh, continue a little bit. 
as I'm a field builder, you know, and if I go to field, I have to see the, I, I like to see the variation because I want to select the plant in the field, right? Tag the plants, select the ones that I feel, okay, this is good one. I think this is just, it's not based on the, uh, the data, uh, uh, the real information that is inside. Uh, you know, now we have a lot of information available, right? So you guys are pushing, okay, we have this proof, this, this, we have done this simulation, and we have uh, done this data analysis from the historical data, and we know. But as a breeder, I, I like the variation. So if we see everything like similar, even if there is, we don't know inside what's inside, right? And that there is differences indefinitely for the yield and other traits. But if we see something very similar, everything, okay, I don't see any variation. I mean, the, the breeders, I think they get afraid, you know? Oh, I'm losing something even if there is, you know, this is just a perception of a field breeder. Yeah, let's pass it to, to, to Maria Fernanda, if someone has a microphone. Uh, but, but, but indeed, I mean, Bo, yeah, I think, uh, the problem is that, right, that you could actually see variation, as also Marley mentioned, but maybe you're not seeing it for the right trait, right? Oh, yeah, maybe there's completely different colors in the, in the leaves, and that doesn't help you at all for, for, for the target, but then you will be very happy because you see variation. So that's where we actually need to come to a balance between, or, or actually putting more weight into using the data that is coming out from those fields with, you know, accurate measurements from machines, or, or, you know, even from people that goes and measure with rulers or whatever it is, but just looking more at what the, uh, you know, the data that we're generating. Maria Fernanda, please go ahead. Oh, okay. I, I have three comments. One, it's uh, probably the simulation to make the comparison between what's the recurrent selection and the, and the other case might have something in the middle between that has been probably the, the target of some of the programs that are not properly or they were recycling, but not with the sense of recycling, but uh, in general, uh, they use pedigree breeding, and then they use lines that were also part of their program to start again a new crosses in the pedigree breeding, and still they, they have the gain, but it's not completely a close, or uh, making the same crosses with the same parents as well. They, they have a little bit of improvement uh, due to uh, a Set a sort of recurrent selection, so it might help to have this intermediate uh, uh, simulation to show what's currently or what happened historically to the programs that were using uh, that kind of approach. So that that could give us a, also an argument and how often you or how good is going to be the improvement to the actual thing, because I think that no none. No one is making the same process with the same uh, parents uh, entirely for 10, 20 years. It's, I think that, that's not, <laughs> it's a real extreme case. <laughs> yeah, very few, yeah, no worries. <laughs> There's still a couple, but, but very few. Okay. Um, but yeah, now let's have that discussion. I think that's going to be an exciting discussion. Uh, yep. But Marley, that, do you want us to go to the next topic, go for a break? Because uh, we're gonna discuss Genetic variance, you know, uh, and, yeah, that, depth. that was a great concept to. But, but yeah, it's, to it's good to start thing. thinking about it. Yeah. May I add something? Yeah, uh, Mr. Probably most of these concerns that we, we can see in breeders, uh, it, it's based on some concepts that you can see in some books. That it's, it's still valuable for those concepts. So, breeders must think uh, how to build a population to work for 20, 30 years. And they remain thinking about that. So uh, I need to select properly the parents because I work on this population for whole my life. But it's not true using genome prediction. So there's no problem. Like we can speed up the process. We can have many populations. We can like vanish the genetic variability. We can, we, we can restart again. So instead of working just one population during your whole life, maybe you can uh, ha work on like 10 populations and three run in parallel, so then we can have different uh, selection criteria for each population, and then later you can combine. So from, from, from my perspective, it's a paradigm shift. So it's not necessary to think in just one population. You can work on many populations at the same time, and there's no worries like uh, 20 years. Probably you can run in corn, it's common rice, three cycles in just one year, 
and in five years we can vanish everything and then we can restart pick the best parents and restart population again so i think the most important thing for me it's explain to them let's break this paradigm like and, and and think a bit different not just one population but many populations so we have more opportunities and there's no problem if you make a mistake we have time to adjust it and restart it's totally different than some years ago that that's my my understanding i might be wrong but that's my understanding okay great so everyone yeah everyone has questions about these topics and this is the intro so over the next few days this is what we will be discussing in detail um, I think you might want like a five minute break before the next section. <laughs> uh, so just get up and move around and if you could come back in five minutes, that would be great. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Move the slide a little bit. Yeah.
good pace. Pace is okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bert. Okay. The microphone is a good addition. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, I can talk a little louder. I worry about like blowing out, yeah. Just a bit louder. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback, yeah. Okay, so before we move into the next section, um, I wanted to let you know that if you're really interested in quantitative genetics or it's something that you've like heard of but you're becoming more interested in, um, I would recommend this book as a nice introduction. Um, it's not too heavy on math. And it's relatively brief. I think it's only like um, the first 150 pages or so that you would need to get through to, to be in pretty good shape <laughs> compared to probably many others who are interested in this. Um, so the PDF is actually in the Dropbox. And um, it's right here in day two. And that's the full PDF of the book. It's not just the title page or anything. So that's there for you for sure. Anytime, yeah. Um, there are other great books too. This is just one that I think is a good start. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, of course, the EIB toolbox. Um, let me try to find it. Yeah. It's too quiet. So anyway, um, sorry, I'll, here's the breeding scan optimization toolbox. And um, we have some manuals and other things up here that you might be interested in or uh, care to refer to. So I think other people will, will mention these too. But for example, we were talking about heritability in the last uh, conversation. So here's a manual. And particularly for the section we're about to go into, um, there are some nice, nice things about um, estimating surrogates of genetic value and selection intensity and so forth. So please feel free to check those out. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so I want to move into the next section. Is the sound okay now? Thanks again. Um, we have about an hour and 15 minutes for this, so we'll finish a little bit past 11. Um, so this section is really about the genetics of selection. This is about transmitting value across generations by selection. So we're going to discuss what selection is <laughs> to start. Um, we'll talk about how individuals have different value as parents compared to as products to some extent. We'll take a deep dive into how alleles create genetic value in populations. And then we'll talk about different possible selection values you might be interested in using, um, as well as how to estimate them. I'm going to warn you for the section about how to estimate things, I'm just not going to make eye contact with this half of the room, because they're all biometricians and they're all better at it than me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that'll be nice to have your inputs and ideas. And then finally, we'll, we'll go over selection units. So the big ideas uh, I think that are important to keep in mind here are that Sometimes we lose focus on the population when we're breeding. Um, people are focusing on looking for an exceptional individual. They're looking for a large effect QTL or something like that. And that causes us to miss the forest for the trees, okay? We miss the big things for the small things because individuals are just temporary arrangements of alleles in a population, okay? So when it comes to being parents, they're just the means to the end in the breeding process and um, they're nothing permanent, right? They're just part of the population. So a lot of this is going to be talking about how to connect individuals to a population in terms of the genetics. So again, the, the practical question we want to address is how to select well. Um, so let's start by asking, what is selection? Um, selection refers to choosing parents of the next generation. Um, I would like it if we could differentiate selection from advancement, OK? Advancement is going to refer to choosing units for further evaluation. We advance them to the next stage of the breeding pipeline. But um, that's, you know, uh, I think in casual speech, we sometimes call that selection. But I would prefer that we really reserve selection for talking about choosing the parents. 
We do differentiate these in part because the values you're going to use for them should probably be different, all right? Um, the value of individual genotypes as parents can be different from their value as products. Let's look at a quick example of that breeding scheme we looked at before. After we make our crosses, um, we have some clones that get advanced for further evaluation, okay? They also get evaluated here at this stage, and they get selected as well for their value as parents. They get recycled, fine. Next, we move them into the product development, um, you know, a more advanced stage of product development, and they again get advanced further as products, and then we're going to release the variety. So the reason I'm putting emphasis on individuals having these different values as parents compared to their per se value um, is that basically parents can't transmit their full genotype to their progeny, so they don't transmit the phenotype. So we need to start thinking about how to get the stuff from the parents we want into the progeny. Maybe you all have the same issue with your own children and getting them to behave <laughs> or something like that. That's just a joke. Um, so, individuals should usually be advanced on their per se performance as products, but they should be selected on their values of, uh, as parents of the next generation. Uh, so, in this section, we're going to discuss how to dissect that, again, transmissible portion from the non-transmissible portion. Um, if we cross, again, that small broccoli to a large broccoli, um, their average progeny is going to inter be intermediate. It doesn't look exactly like either of the parents, of course. We wouldn't expect it to, but we want to maximize that value. So like I was saying, um, parents do not transmit their full genome to their progeny. They only transmit half of it, okay? And they transmit the genome not randomly, but as gametes, okay, that are maybe stuck, stuck together with different kinds of linkage and things like that. And then the progeny inherit half of their genome from each parent. Um, so looking over here, we could have two fully inbred parents and one of their chromosome pairs right here. Um, they undergo recombination, but nothing really happens because they're fully inbred. It's not effective. And their F1 progeny just get half of each of their parents' recombined chromosomes. Okay? No problem. Um, now this time, the parental genome is going to undergo effective recombination before transmission occurs. Um, if we are going to intermate these guys, uh, We'll see some of these crossovers uh, result in new types of gametes, okay? And um, these can be crossed to form an F2. Now, the F2 still inherit half of each parent's re recombined chromosomes, but um, we have this opportunity uh, to see that we can't really send alleles directly <laughs> into the next genotype. Um, and also that once um, the parent genome halves are in a new individual, they can interact in new ways, all right? So we can say that having a pink allele here and a yellow allele here um, confers some value, but we could say that having them together too could be different than just having one or the other uh, separately. Anyway, if you have a different genotype, I think it's pretty intuitive that that's going to result in a different phenotype. So this is going on under the surface, but maybe what we see is a large parent crossed to a small parent. Uh, it produces a progeny. The progeny isn't identical to the parent, but it resembles it, okay? Uh, and in the F2, again, um, these, none of these are exactly like their parents, but we don't have anything like completely huge outside of this distribution. Um, they're all gray, none of them have turned green. Um, they're all circles, none of them have become triangles, all right? They resemble their parents. Um, so the question we ask is how we maximize transmission of value by choosing parents in a population. And to answer this, we need to think more about how alleles at loci across the genome create genetic value. I think this is going to be interesting for this group for two reasons. Um, one is if you come from a statistical background, this might be a nice time to brush up on genetics. The other is that if you come from more of a um, functional genomics or molecular genetics background, um, there are a couple of definitions in quantitative genetics that are deceptively similar <laughs> to those fields, but actually have really different technical meanings. So I'm going to try to highlight those, um, because I think that will enable you to, to you know, read the literature more effectively and so forth. 
So alleles of quantitative traits are going to create genetic value in three main ways from our perspective. Um, and then to get a genetic value, in theory, you could just add up the effects of every locus in the genome and all of their combinations to get the value of that individual. Um, so that's genetic value. And then we're going to make other definitions of value, again, to connect allelic value to breeding populations. So the first mechanism of gene action is going to be additivity. Okay? We can consider that the number of copies of a variant allele just additively affect the phenotype. Okay? So in a diploid, if I have 0, 1, or 2 copies of a certain allele, maybe my phenotypes or my genetic values, without error, um, are 1, 2, and 3. And there's just this linear increase in um, the phenotype as you gain copies of that alternate allele. Another possibility is that the locus exhibits dominance. In this case, you have combinations of alleles within a locus, and they non-additively affect your phenotype. So maybe um, if you have a homozygote, its value is, again, 1. But if you have the heterozygote, um, it's actually not um, the midpoint of these two. It's higher or lower. So in this case, maybe the, the values are like 1, 1 1.9, and 2. All right, dominance. Finally, um, with epistasis, we can have combinations of alleles that across loci will not additively affect the phenotype. Um, so if you look down here, I know this is kind of complicated to see visually, but we just have um, two loci, and we either have zero copies at both loci or up to two at each locus. Yeah. And as you look across these, you see kind of a nice um, thing where if you have a zero, with either of these, it seems like they're a bit lower. But if you have the two zeros together, that individual is really good, and it's kind of weird. So that would be an example of epistasis, where a particular combination of genotypes or alleles produces a deviation in value compared to what we would expect by just adding up those values. So um, in a population, um, we do define the genotypic values at each locus. Um, and this is pretty simple. Um, this is pretty compatible with how we see dominance and epistasis, like just in, in general genetics and Mendelian genetics. Um, so the additive effect of your allele is just the deviation of the maximum mean genetic value of the homozygous genotype from the average uh, genetic value of individuals which are homozygous for either locus, all right? So from this zero genotype to this one genotype, we take their average um, and find the deviation from the midpoint. So the only thing about this is that we, we do measure it as that deviation from the mean. I think there are other ways to do it, but you have to pick one and be consistent. In this case, um, the AA small genotype has a value of one. The big A genotype has a value of two. Their midpoint is 1.5, so the additive effect of this uh, allele, big A, is 0.5. Um, for each unit of, um, yeah. <laughs> dominance is a little bit different. Um, the dominance effect of the allele here is going to be measured as the deviation of the average genetic value of the individuals which are heterozygous from the average value of the individuals which are homozygous. So this is where we start to kind of leave behind that view with Mendelian. Um, I mean, this is a Mendelian behavior. But um, I think that when we think about a dominant uh, allele, we think of that classical case where you cross two segregating individuals, and then the progeny, which are heterozygous, show the phenotype of you know, whatever the dominant phenotype is. But this is just a little bit more subtle. Okay, We're going to put a number on the deviation and we're going to measure it as a deviation from the mean of the homozygotes. So in this case, um, we already said the mean of our homozygotes is 1.5. And then if we take the mean of all the heterozygous genotypes, um, we have a deviation of 1 from that 1.5. So those are the allelic effects. Those are not something we can usually measure directly, um, except for simple traits, especially with a lot of genes. Um, but that's fine, because our goal isn't really to measure the effects of alleles. Our goal is to increase the value of populations. So for that purpose, um, we're going to introduce this idea of average effects and dominance deviations. 
This is not something you need to necessarily think about day to day. I'm just going to explain it so that if you run into some quantitative genetics down the road, uh, you have this fundamental here. Um, so like I was saying, uh, we can't really estimate the A and D effects of each allele alone. Um, so we need to have a measure of how our population mean is going to change if we substitute an allele for another. And substituting is kind of weird. It makes me think of like, I don't know, pushing allele into, into it or something. But if you think of it instead as changing the frequency of the allele, that's something you do every day, right, by selection. So we're, we need a value that will say, if we make selection, we change the frequency of the allele, how does the population mean change? So in this case, we have some alleles floating around in a population. And we're going to say, what if we took this minus allele and via selection, we substituted in the plus allele? That's all it is. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that um, the effect of the allele, the additive effect is 2, and the dominant select is 4. Um, the blue positive allele is going to be the P allele here, and the red um, negative allele is the Q allele. Um, so assuming we start at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we know the relationship of the alleles to the genotypes, right? Um, we know that P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is going to give us each of those genotype frequencies if we know the allele frequencies. And that's really nice. <laughs> that's really helpful. And we don't always have to assume that. But um, if we know that, we can also see that the P alleles are going to always produce PP or PQ genotypes if they randomly unite with another allele in the population through the gametes. And the Q alleles are always going to produce um, PQ and QQ genotypes. And I think that if you want, you can move them around and prove this to yourself. Maybe you, you can see it for yourself. But if I have this P allele and I pull any other allele from the population, like there's no way I'm going to get the other genotype. That's obvious. You can all see that. I'm never going to get a QQ genotype, and vice versa. So the population is like kind of stuck. It's, it's really trapped here um, in that we know, if we know the allele frequencies and we know the genotype frequencies, um, we can infer <laughs> with a, the substitution or a change in frequency of the allele what's going to happen. So what we're going to say is then that the average value of the genotypes that result from that random mating depends on the frequency of the alleles that are available, right? Because this population is like kind of trapped here, and we have a little bit more P alleles little, little bit than Q alleles. So we know we're going to have more PP genotypes than QQ genotypes with random mating. And if we know the values of those genotypes, and we know we're at Hardy-Weinberg, then we can use an equation to say what the value would be if we change the frequency of the allele, OK? So to get the average value of the genotypes that would be produced by randomly changing, um, sorry, randomly uniting the available P alleles with the other available alleles in the population, that's actually always going to be um, the frequency of the P allele times its additive effect, right? Because it's homozygous, so it has the A value, it doesn't get dominance value because it's homozygous, not heterozygous. And then um, it's going to produce some heterozygotes as well when it unites with Q. So we take the frequency of the Q allele, which is how often it's going to unite with that Q allele, right, and multiply that times the dominance value. So in that sense, we can very directly say, with random mating, this is what we would expect to get out of this population. I'm going to stay out of presentation mode because I think I might want to move more around. <laughs> um, now, the last thing that we need to do uh, is to define a baseline or a point of reference. Um, so in quantitative genetics, um, we always call this the base population. Um, and that does have like kind of a specialized meaning. So some people may be tempted to refer to um, like your starting set of genotypes in a new breeding program as a base population. And that's fine uh, in, in general, but this does have a technical meaning as the population with the allele frequencies and value that is our point of reference. If you actually want to go through and do the math, which I'm not expecting anyone to want to do. Um, so we're going to measure the effect of this allele substitution going from minus to plus relative to the base population. 
That way, when we make selection over time, we have a consistent starting point. We have a consistent point from which we're making gain. Um, and we don't measure the effect of the allele in that new population formed by the substitution, because that, that doesn't really make sense, because we're defining the change, change from here to here, not just what is going on. Um, so to do that, um, we know that by going from negative to positive, uh, we get this new value of genotypes compared to the old population, right? Because this new allele randomly unites with all those other alleles. So that's the PA plus QD genotypic value you saw on the next slide. And then all we need to do to measure that relative to the base population is to subtract the mean of the base population, okay? And we're good. And this equation looks uh, kind of painful, but all it is is the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium mean of this population. You're gonna see P squared plus 2PQ plus uh, Q squared right in there. And those are the frequencies of our genotypes. And for each genotype, we multiply it by its genotypic value. So the homozygotes, um, which are P, are gonna get negative A. The heterozygotes get the D. And then um, the homozygotes for the Q allele get a positive A. So that's all this equation is doing at the end of the day. <laughs> but the big idea here is that we're no longer thinking what is just the additive effect of the allele. We're thinking what happens if I change this allele? What can I expect the population mean to do, all right? So by going from this negative to the positive, we expect the uh, value of the population mean to increase, right, relative to the base population. And now we can say how much in a slightly technical way. So if you were to take the values that were given in the previous slide and go through and crunch this equation, it wouldn't really be that bad. Um, and you'd find that the effect of substituting this negative allele into this positive allele is 1.28 on the population mean, okay? So this is not something that I'd expect we'd use every day, but for those of you who are doing like genomic selection or something, you might need to know the mechanics of this. Uh, it's, it's helpful. Um, the, the, the big idea again is that you don't wanna always use the biological effect of the allele directly. Uh, you need to put that biological effect in the context of the population via the allele frequencies, okay? So the additive effect doesn't just depend on the allelic effects, it also depends on their frequency in the population. Um, so yeah, that was what I was just saying. I said it too soon because I love saying it, <laughs> that's okay. Um, and also I just want you to know that the equation in the previous slide does simplify really nicely. Um, the average effect of the allele is gonna be equal to the additive effect plus the dominance effect times the difference in those allele frequencies. Boja. Can we go back two slides? Yeah. Great question, yeah. This is the value of the genotypes that we get when we randomly mate um, the individuals in this population, assuming we change one negative allele to one positive allele. Yeah, no, um, so what we say then is we've gone from one negative allele to a positive allele. So we know that by taking the allele frequencies um, of either allele, uh, they can only unite with other alleles, right? So we know, for example, the P allele uh, upon random union will never produce a QQ genotype. So we can actually get the value of those genotypes by saying, well, the P allele, if it's at this frequency, is gonna produce so many PP genotypes. And they always have a value of two, right? So you can multiply it. And then they're also gonna produce some heterozygotes. And how many heterozygotes they produce depends on you know, what's floating around for them to connect with. So um, that's why the frequency determines, the frequency of the alleles determines the frequency of the genotypes. And then if we know the values of all those things, as well as the value of the genotype, we can connect all these together. Does that make sense? Yes. Great question. So if, you, uh, so if you remove the population mean from that one, so it will be substitution, right? Yep, then you get the effect of the allelic substitution. And the only difference between saying, um, this is the, the value I get when I switch that and saying this is the average effect is that we rel measure it relative to the base population mean, I would say. So can you please explain why there is minus A in the first? Yeah. The first one? Yeah, yeah. Yes, excellent question. 
So P and Q, um, let's see here. Oh, you know, Shelfei, I think I have this backwards. I apologize. This should be positive P in this example, and this should be negative A. Great catch. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so what Shafei is pointing out is that I said the P allele had the, the bigger value, so it shouldn't be the negative one. Very good. I also want to mention that um, I said a lot about assuming Hardy-Weinberg here because it enables us to connect the frequency of the allele to the frequency of the genotype. But you don't have to assume Hardy-Weinberg, actually. Um, you can correct this for a certain amount of inbreeding uh, via the inbreeding coefficient f. It's just that the math gets like a kind of more blah. And um, <laughs> it's like, if you think about inbreeding, right, it means you have more homozygotes than you'd expect under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And if you know how inbred po your population is, you can just correct for that, no big deal. Okay, I think this is the most response we've ever gotten out of this section. Usually people just stare and are like, ah, I wish this were over. <laughs> so thank you for, <laughs> thank you for asking. Um, yeah, yeah, Rosa. How do we calculate all this with our data? Yeah, sure. And how do we know A, D, B, Q? Yeah. Is there like an R? No, so, so we don't usually need to estimate these directly for like standard things, but if you're using genomic selection, um, you, there's one way to do it where you would estimate these things, okay? Um, and that would just be a regression of your phenotypes on your marker genotypes, and they're going to be coded in a particular way, and those are going to give you estimates of those marker effects, and you're going to have an estimate of their frequency from your genotype information, right? Um, in some situations, too, um, the breeding value is equal to the additive value you estimate if you don't fit dominance, but don't worry about that. Just leave it to your biometrician. This is just a theoretical thing that is helpful for, for using GS. Is that okay? Okay. Um, another thing I want to clarify, too, just for people who want to get technical with genomic prediction, is that, um, of course, like we were saying, the average effect depends on the allele frequencies, right? Because in the population, we're looking at the change in the substitution. But the average effect is also not the same as the additive effect of that allele. And I think there, it's, it's kind of hard to tease that out in the literature. There's a nice paper by Falconer about this, if you're interested. And the average effect actually partially includes the dominance effect at the end of the day. Does anyone know why the average effect should include the dominance effect? What do you think? Yeah, so even with random mating of an allele, it produces some heterozygotes, right? So that produces dominance. So on average, yeah, with mating of some allele, you get some heterozygotes. Um, I found this phrasing so confusing, so I hope that this is, uh, this is reasonable. Uh, even actually, you know, when you go to books like Bernardo's, they, they really said that it's a bad practice to call this the additive effect because in the presence of dominance, this loses uh, its sense. And that has you know, brought a lot of confusion, especially because we always use this in terms of the, uh, let's say, line breathing. So people say, oh, yeah, additive, you know, allylic effects, they just think additive. But this is why, you know, we're saying that not only the additive part gets transmitted, it really depends on, you know, the strategy of breathing that you're using. Sorry, Marley, please keep going. No, thanks for bringing that up. I, I forgot to mention, like Eduardo is saying, there are a few special cases where the average effect is equal to the additive effect, like he's saying with line breeding, which is why this has gotten confused, all right? So if you look at this here, when is alpha equal to A? What could happen in this equation to make these two things equal? Well, D could be zero, right? If there's no dominance, like Eduardo was saying with line breeding, or if these allele frequencies were both 0.5, which would be like kind of a fluke thing, but yeah. Okay, so thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> I forgot. There's only one more that we'll worry about today. Um, so the average effect of the allele, um, you can also think of it as the regression of the phenotype value for each type of genotype um, on the dosage of that genotype, okay? And what actually happens is that the average effect um, will give you the slope of this line and the value of increasing one unit 
of that allele, like we were saying in the population. Um, but like we said, that average effect includes the dominance effect, but there's also something called dominance deviation in the population. All right? So what happens is, if we have a heterozygote that doesn't fall directly between the two homozygotes, this regression line gets pulled up or in the direction of that heterozygote, right? So this actually doesn't just affect, um, it's not saying that this is something specific to the heterozygote either. Um, the pulling up of that regression line also affects the homozygotes. Isn't that crazy? Okay, this is why the average effect is so different from the additive effect. This is why the dominance deviation is so different from the dominance value. Because the dominance value is only given to the heterozygotes, right? We can only measure that in heterozygotes. But the dominance deviation is actually the deviation in the average value of the population due to some, something the heterozygotes are doing. Heterozygotes are trouble, let me tell you that. They just cause problems. <laughs> so anyway, this is just, um, just for you to know. Um, so sometimes we fit average effects of alleles and then um, maybe their dominance deviations for situations where um, we want to keep in mind that those heterozygotes are having a different value. Um, the other thing that I think might make, make this clear is to say that these allelic statistical effects are just not equal to the biological effects. So if you're reading a paper, I think the naming of the statistical effects um, makes it easy to confuse with those underlying biological effects. Um, you may be tempted if you read a paper and see there's not much dominance genetic variance, you might be tempted to say, oh, dominance isn't important in that population. But that's not always true. The ratio of those variances are not gonna tell you anything about the underlying gene action, partly because that average effect includes the dominance effect, also because you could have problems with your estimation, and also because, um, because of the way we parameterize um, these things, I think that the dominance variance can tend to be smaller and so forth, just because it's a deviation. Um, but anyway, yeah, don't, don't think that if you don't observe dominance or something like that, it's not important in your population. It really depends how you measure it. To try to make that a little clearer, I wanna contrast these three things that we've shown, okay? The first one is this um, value of the phenotype for individuals with a given genotype down here. Um, this is sort of the Mendelian situation where we say this individual has um, the phenotype of one, um, this individual maybe has incomplete dominance. And I think that too, we, we maybe say to ourselves like, oh, the value of the, the dominant genotype is this whole thing, right? Um, for example, if I cross a purple and a white flower and I get a dark uh, or a light purple flower as the heterozygote, but it's like pretty dark, <laughs> um, we say that that whole value is like the the dominance value. Um, but in quantitative genetics, we need to measure that precisely, and we need it to be measured as a deviation from the mean of those additive values, or at least in a consistent way. The reason I'm emphasizing this is if you talk with molecular geneticists and you say dominance isn't heritable with random mating, they're gonna say to you, you're telling me a dominant allele isn't, can't be inherited. That's what they hear. So I don't want you to hear that. This is saying that dominant alleles can be inherited, but what we wanna measure is the average effect of that in the population. It's not actually a literal measure of how much that genotype is. So the long story short is just, you know, don't confuse these things and um, keep in mind that your average effects in the presence of dominance are not the same as your additive effects. And yes, you can go from there and read whatever you want to. So let's go back to breeding. Um, now that we've taken the time to put this in, um, why do we care about any of this? Uh, Rosa was asking this, like how can we actually use these? Should we be calculating them? What's, what's going on? Um, the big deal is that we want to know how much changing allele frequency can change our population mean. That's always been our goal. So the next question is, how can we create these different values that are gonna maximize value in a future generation and not just the current one? So with recurrent selection, we saw how just selecting on phenotype could start concentrating those favorable alleles. And that's pretty much all that we wanna do, right? Um, but there are actually other things that we could like to be more careful about. 
that could lead us to select on other values. And we're going to go through what those are. Um, we're also going to go through how to estimate them, like you were asking. The previous section kind of was like, oh, let's say we have the true values, or we estimated them from really specific data sets. Um, so we're going to go through how to estimate those selection values via those surrogates of selection values. And we have a nice visual of the chickens and how they've changed, really, from 2000 to 2016. That is like a monster chicken. Wow. <laughs> That's a good one. So just to get like, familiar with this concept, some different possible selection values we could use. Like, what are these? Um, they could be a breeding value. They could be a family mean breeding value, total genetic value, combining ability, general or specific, um, cross-performance, optimum contribution, usefulness criterion, and even combinations of the above. So you could have the optimum contributions of crosses in a population. Uh, you could have among family selection followed by within family selection. You can do anything. And new selection values are developed really frequently. Um, the units for inbreeding control tend to be really popular. So like, I think there are more than 10, but they're all pretty similar to optimum contribution. Um, an example of what these would look like. Um, so your breeding value is your average effect of the allelic substitution. And this is what we've been using for so long. This is what a lot of the literature started with, um, where it, you know, it's your additive plus your dominance effect plus the difference in the allele frequencies. Um, if you estimate these off of markers that are just additive, um, then what you view is those additive effects that are estimated are directly your breeding values, which can be confusing, but you can keep that in mind. Um, but the big idea with the breeding value, too, is that um, it doesn't, it, it takes into account the fact that your parents only transmit half of their genome, right? So it takes into account that your genotypes maybe won't um, transmit any dominance value if they're heterozygous or outbred. They can't transmit that with random mating, okay? Because you just, you have your two parents, um, and then, yeah, they're drawn at random from the population. So you have no control over what two combinations of alleles get inherited together. Does that make sense? Can everyone visualize that? OK, sounds good. Um, another type of selection value is general combining ability, which you all know about, but actually has this really neat allelic definition. Boja? So, all means we connect our date, right? So that's why we normally say the parents don't transmit their dominance effect. Is that so? But uh, maybe they may it means, yeah, they, they don't transmit, um, yeah, the exact heterozygous genotype. Let's do a quick visual, I think. Um, it doesn't really have to do with whether you can predict it. It has to do with whether you transmit it. Because even if you predict it perfectly, that doesn't mean you can transmit it. So going back to our population here, let's draw a couple parents. Let's pretend these are all made into genotypes. Now, some of these are going to be heterozygous and some are homozygous. So, which ones have dominance value? The heterozygous. Thank you. So, only these guys have dominance value. Let's pretend this is a special allele showing a lot of heterosis. These individuals are, like, really good. They're much better than um, these other homozygotes here. Now, we're going to do random mating into the next generation, okay? Since it's random, I don't get to control whether progeny all get to be heterozygous, right? So let's pair these two. Let's pair these two. And this one is the odd one out. So we know that on average, we get a certain number of heterozygotes, but um, we don't have control over which specific genotypes get united. Does that make sense? Because it's going to be important in a second. I think it'll make more sense when we show um, what happens when you are able to control that. So let's go through that now. Um, a general, yeah, a, a general combining ability <clears throat> is one value that can actually allow you to transmit dominance. It's not typically thought of in that way, but we will show you how and why that works. But you know that general combining ability is defined between two different pools, all right? And um, 
what's basically going to happen in those pools if we select on these values, wherein the breeding value of an individual in one pool is defined by the frequencies of alleles in the opposite pool. Um, as we select on those over time, what happens is the allele frequencies get drawn apart, and then you can control whether there are heterozygous genotypes in the next generation to some extent, because you have pulled apart different alleles in each pool, and by, when you reunite them, you're more likely to get that heterozygote. Okay, so that's non-random mating. Two pooling is an example of non-random mating, and that can lead you to harness some of that dominance value in a way that you couldn't when you had one pool. It wasn't that you weren't getting some of the dominance value with one pool, but you were losing it when you kept, um, you know, having to randomly, randomly mate them. So, um, so Marley, if I can add just a quick yeah. comment there. I mean, that's why, you know, because the, the term breeding value is very popular in animal breeding, and they normally always work with a single pool, well, you know, kind of this uh, first layer. That, that's why they never say about transmitting the dominance, right? They always just talk about breeding value as if it was only the additive portion. But the thing is that now that plant breeding is starting to use the, the concepts like breeding value and, and, and the general combining ability is also some sort of breeding value. Well, you can also say that actually the dominance can be transmitted. It's just, it's just that you need two pools in order to actually control for the, for the, you know, for the increase in dominance. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Manny. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> just so you don't think we're making things up. <laughs> Dominance can be transmitted. <laughs> um, another way that I don't think anyone in this room is maybe using this, but another way you can transmit dominance temporarily in a single pool, which Christian actually invented, believe it or not, is called predicted cross-performance. Um, so this is kind of cool. Um, what you do is you use your markers and get allelic effects for your parents, and then you have the genotypes of the parents, so you can predict with non-random mating, what if you had like coupling of the parents with specific pairs? And then you are able to cut and paste those genotypes in such a way that you get more heterozygosity. If you think back to that picture of our population where we were putting the parents together, we mated them randomly, but you could just as well mate them in such a way that you maximize the value of the progeny. No one's stopping you from doing that. So yeah. So this is very cool, um, it's very exciting, and it's really kind of simple at the end of the day. The mechanics are super interesting, and I think they're fun to think about. Today is a day for you to just enjoy thinking about them. But in practice, we usually keep this pretty simple, okay? The optimal selection value you might want to use in your population really just depends on the trait genetic architecture and the time horizon of your breeding program, okay? Um, the big deal here is, like we were saying, as far as trait genetic architecture goes, um, traits that have dominance can show inbreeding depression and heterosis when you observe genotypes that have too few or extra heterozygotes, right? So you can avoid or exploit that via selection value, uh, GCA, like we were talking about. Um, so that's one major decision, and um, it's really complex to make. Um, and if you're in a polyploid crop, by the way, an autopolyploid crop, um, make sure you just check in with us about how that's going to work, uh, and we will check in with you. <laughs> but the, the basic idea is that you're going to see if there's a lot of inbreeding depression in your population in a diploid, and then decide, oh, do I need to have two pools or not? Um, so that's all you have to do there. The other, the other idea is a little more complicated. Um, this idea is that programs with longer time horizons, longer expected time where they want to make genetic gain, uh, need to maintain more genetic variance and avoid genetic drift via the appropriate selection value. So Dorcas is going to talk a lot more about this. I'm just going to tell you how you can use a selection value to do that. In this case right here, I actually didn't change the selection value at all. I just changed the intensity to demonstrate the time horizon of the breeding program. Which of these do you think was run at the highest intensity? The red one, the blue one, or the black one? You may have guessed that the red one was run at the highest intensity because it makes really quick gain in the short term, but it loses out in the long term, okay? Because by selecting relatively few individuals, we maybe happen to incur more genetic drift so we lost out long-term, 
but in the short term, we concentrated more of those favorable alleles, um, and so on and so forth. So, um, let's go back for a second. I'm going to start by showing you how using a good selection value in a case when you have dominance leading to inbreeding depression and heterosis can improve your breeding program. Um, so we're going to make up a population. And at hardy weidenberg equilibrium, when it's nice and outbred, um, it has a value that's 10 units greater compared to if you fully inbred it. So some of your crops may be like this, right? Um, with maize or with... Um, um, cassava. <laughs> Sorry, Chefe, you're right there. Um, and the reason that we see that in breeding depression is if we have fully inbred lines, they lose the dominance value because of the lack of heterozygosity. And um, yeah, and they don't yet have all of the good alleles that they would want in the homozygous state. So we observe that loss. Um, so anyway, let's imagine we're in this situation. Um, there's a good amount of inbreeding depression in that population. What we're going to look at next is um, doing recurrent selection in the population compared to reciprocal recurrent selection. So um, right here in this panel, we're going to do reciprocal recurrent selection, and we're going to track the value of this population over time. All right. Down here, we're going to do reciprocal recurrent selection on general combining ability, and we're going to track the value of this population over time. All right? So here, we're tracking this in the hybrids. Here, we're tracking it in the within pool outbred genotypes. And finally, we're going to look under the hood again at what's going on with the alleles. All right? So this is to show you how different selection values will lead you to have different allele frequencies and different genotype frequencies as well. All right? So the big deal with this is that we're going to try to see if the heterozygotes tend to be um, enriched in either of these situations. Your homozygotes are in tan, and your heterozygotes are in blue. So now it's going to start running. We're making our selections just like we did in that other simulation. Both of these populations are increasing in mean value. They're both going up. But this one is kind of winning, the reciprocal recurrent selection one. And now, looking at the genetics underlying this, we can see why. It's because by selecting on reciprocal recurrent selection, <coughs> sorry, uh, general combining ability, um, in the two different pools, we've drawn apart allele frequencies, which you might remember from the equation for that. When those get reunited in the hybrid, we have extra heterozygotes compared even to Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Basically, you need non-random mating to break Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And that probably makes sense, because an assumption of Hardy-Weinberg is random mating, right? OK, so now we know why non-random mating can be so useful. In the recurrent selection case um, on the top, I mean, that was still able to increase value at this intensity. We now know that whether it can in the presence of dominance is going to depend on several factors. But we'll always evaluate those with you in your breeding program. But um, even though the average effect, or um, actually, sorry, here I selected on total genetic value, not average effect. Um, even though um, we've included the dominance value here, because we keep random mating, we lose it. We can't enrich the frequency of those heterozygotes because you're only in one pool. OK. Do you have any questions or thoughts, ideas? Yep. Yeah. Recurrent selection? Um, in this case, it was, um, I think I selected like 10 out of 100 genotypes and then recycled them. Yeah, just one pool. Thanks. Yeah, recurrent selection in a single pool. Great question. OK. And, and just to add, even if you know if Marley was using two pools, but he was using recurrent selection in these independent pools, the problem is that they will be fixing probably some of the similar alleles. So even if, if she makes the hybrids, maybe the picture would look a bit more similar. But the, the, the thing is that the reciprocal recurrent selection, what it allows is to do like a coordinated selection effort. So somehow pool one is going in one direction, pool go is going in the other direction in a way that they complement optimally. 
So even at the end of the day, even if he was doing the recurrent selection with two pools and plotting the hybrids instead of the lines, still the reciprocal recurrent selection would be better because it was a coordinated effort between these two pools. Yeah, the blues are, yeah, how does I get stay? Because the one at the bottom, she's plotting the hybrids. Mm -hmm. So the hybrids look better, and of course the genotypes are heterozygote for some, well, for, you know, for uh, several genes or QTLs, but you can see that there is also homozygote, which means that actually for some QTLs, both pools actually fix the same, probably because for that particular gene or QTL, that was the positive allele. I mean, you need to fix it. But in the case on the upper um, figure, she's plotting the, the actual individuals, the lines, you know? So, so you're not seeing the hybrids. This is just single pool. But again, trying to repeat myself, even if she was plotting again hybrids because she was doing two recurrent selection that are in parallel, you know, kind of independent, they would still, I mean, it would look very similar to the one at the bottom, but it, it would not be as good anyways because it's not a coordinated um, effort. Um, and probably uh, Chris just arrived, but he has been making a, a very valuable comment when, uh, when we have this discussion, and is that um, actually that doesn't mean that the reciprocal recurrent selection is necessarily the best strategy that we have always embedded. I just think that at the end of the day, there is always a positive allele. And actually, the, the whole point is that you want to fix the, the best possible allele. And the hybrid strategy on reciprocal recurrent selection, what it's doing is that it's fixing some alleles in both pools, but for others, it's fixing the opposite allele, and that's where you get the heterozygote. But actually, if there is a, a good allele, in essence, you want both copies. You don't want one of the good ones and one of the bad ones. So actually, there is a still additional improvement that could be done over the reciprocal recurrent selection scheme. Um, and, and I don't know if Christian can make it or can say it in a better way than myself, but, but basically just selecting, just a, a, rec a recurrent selection in a single pool can actually be better if you allow for enough time with, with not too much genetic drift. I mean, if you were able to control all these things, the best strategy would be still to select in a single pool for reading value to fix always the positive alleles for all the QTLs. The thing is that in practice, that is really, really difficult. And that's why the reciprocal recurrent selection is so good. And it shows to be better in the case of maize than just selecting in a single pool. Because it's like the RRS is like a short term, you know, the best short term strategy. I don't want to get maybe in the, <laughs> in the weeds. Well, when you use, well, per se performance, you know, at the end of the day, when you say per se performance, uh, you have to use, uh, well, that's the breeding value. Well, it is not. Well, when you say per se performance, it's like I'm actually putting the plants in the field. But you have to create a selection value, right? When you, if, you, if it was only a single pool, the selection value is breeding value, is the first one, because it's only a single pool. So what I'm trying to say is that the best strategy is actually that one. The simplest one, breeding value at the top, that is the best strategy in general. If you can control for not enough drift, if you have a really long cycle time, if you have enough accuracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but for short term, for leveraging dominance, general combining ability or reciprocal recurrent selection makes a better job. I don't know if this is, 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 is you know, this subtle difference can be captured or not, but GCA of course makes sense because it's a way to exploit dominance in the short term. But in the long term, actually the breeding value strategy is the best. But the thing is that you will never really breed for that period of time. You will never be able in your breeding populations to have such a control in, in, the, in the genetic drift. So I think that's why in practice uh, GCA, you know, always, I mean, is used because it really leverages. Uh, but I will let Christian maybe explain it better than myself. No, I actually think you explained it very well. Um, the only thing I'd like to add is, while that all 
traces back to the three um, heteroses hypothesis that probably you all know from um, from university. Are you going to sort that out? So one of them is, as you will know, the dominant theory, one is the over-dominant theory, and one is the epistatic or epistasis theory. Um, we can leave out epistasis here because no one really knows how to breed for epistasis. We observe epistasis. It's important, at least the physiological one, but again, we cannot breed for it. We don't know how to breed for it, so we can ignore this bit. And then there are the other two, dominance and over-dominance. We know, or we assume that in practice, heterosis, well, heterosis is a quantitative trait, and all of it plays a role. There's some dominant, there's some overdominance, there's some apostasis. But I think what at least the literature suggests is that there are very, very little um, loci that actually show overdominance. So in general, we have something where um, the heterozygote is better than the um, than the, the mean of both homozygotes. But still, as Eduardo said, um, the homozygote with the two beneficial alleles will be better than the heterozygote. The heterozygote is somewhere in between. So in the short term, you will have that benefit from, from heterosis because it's better than, um, than the mean of the two combinations. But in the long term, what you want, ideally, is the homozygote of the two good alleles stacked at all low C. And this is a line, this is an inbred line. So um, again, I, as Eduardo said, I, I did a few initial simulations so far, and what you will see is that um, until it pays off to, to breed for the lines, um, for example, in a, in a maize breeding problem, it takes, it takes a decent amount of time, and it goes over that amount of time that we normally suggest to think of. So there is a reason to go for hybrid breeding. Um, but again, in the long term, it's not the optimal theory. It pays off for you in breeding, but it's not the best um, outstanding theory, uh, sorry, breeding scheme there is. And, and you can see that here, like Christian's mentioning, in the case of incomplete dominance, your heterozygote doesn't have your best value, right? You would actually prefer this um, double homozygote. But um, in the case that you can't get that, and you're not going to get this all the time, you really want to avoid this, right? So that's what reciprocal recurrent selection is doing. It's avoiding that, that negative state. Great comments. So yeah, um, in an application, if we think that your program should be moving to a hybrid program, we are talking with you <laughs> in great detail. So don't feel worried like you need to decide this all yourself. In fact, don't, please don't. Um, we've had really great conversations with Chef A and um, implementing hybrid breeding in his program, and um, it's really been a process. So we're always here to support you if that's needed. So yeah, like I was saying, um, when, it, when it comes to selection values, your trait genetic architecture is one of your big deciders on what you use. Um, the other big one is your breeding time horizon, which we're going to talk about now. I do want to mention, um, you guys started talking about epistasis and how we don't typically breed for epistasis. Epistasis refers to those combinations of alleles across loci. So why is it that we don't really breed for epistasis directly? Why can't we breed combinations of alleles across loci into a genotype? Because they just get mixed up. <laughs> okay, like they're going to recombine, all kinds of stuff. They're, you know, no one's looked that far into it. Maybe with markers, if, if you could even estimate it, you could like pick at least the best ones out of what you have. But over, yeah, over time, you don't have any glue to stick those together. Cecile? Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And there, there is some trend I don't quite understand, like you're saying with linkage and stuff, where if you select on the average effect, like you do get some of the epistasis, but like I said, I don't, I can't explain it. So it's just interesting. <laughs> Okay, so moving on from the trait genetic architectures, which are super fun, um, let's talk about the breeding time horizon and how your selection value can consider that. Um, up here, I'm going to show you two different populations. Um, we're going to do recurrent selection as usual and track our mean genetic value over breeding cycles. The population in blue here is going to use a selection value that avoids inbreeding. I'm not going to tell you which one because there are a lot of different ones you could use, like optimum contribution or anything else. The population in black is just using regular truncation selection. So what do you see here? You see a trade-off between um, the short and the long-term genetic gain, okay, with avoiding inbreeding, preventing occasional fixation of favorable alleles, um, but in the long term also preventing unfavorable fixation of unfavorable alleles and allowing more, um, more gain. And in the short term, um, you know, the opposite trend being true. Um, so this is something you can manipulate with the appropriate selection value. I'm not going to tell you whether you should or any more about this because Dorcas will go into it. Um, I just want you to be aware that when it comes to maintaining genetic variance and keeping that genetic diversity <laughs> in your population, using the right selection value is a way you can do that. People always think, if I want more genetic variants, I need to introgress more and more genotypes into my population. But another thing you can do is to give yourself more time to sort out those good and bad alleles by use of the right selection value. Um, I have a handy guide, if you'd like, for typical selection values we end up recommending by crop type. Um, if you're a diploid or an alley polyploid, um, if it's fully inbred, you're typically, typically going to select on a genomic estimated breeding value. Um, of course, because you don't have dominance in your product. Um, you can add the usefulness criterion we talked about to get more variance in your crosses. You can add inbreeding control to prevent drift. Um, our inbred hybrid systems uh, typically use genomic estimated general combining ability. Again, we can add or subtract uh, usefulness and inbreeding control. Um, and in some situations, these, these right here, which, which of these you end up doing, does depend on how much inbreeding, pop, inbreeding depression, heterosis you have. But that's something we will go through with you. Um, but you might also want to use genomic predicted cross performance. And then another thing I'm just going to say and not explain is that with our autopolyploids, we've actually found um, that those are typically clonal hybrids. And um, you're going to typically want to use a genomic estimated breeding value. Um, there are some situations where that's not true. Um, the basic idea is that these autopolyploids are so heterozygous already that you don't really benefit from having those pools to increase more heterozygosity. Um, so that's why we found this to be the case. That's not to say you can't see heterosis in autopolyploids. That's not all what we're saying. It's about how to harness it. But we've, we've talked at length with the teams for whom that's relevant. But other than potato, I don't think we've discussed that potato yet. Okay, so those, those are selection values. Um, I want to check the time. Those are the different things you could use to maximize value in your population. Um, anyway, I think we'll go maybe another 20 minutes because the exercise is pretty short. And we're going to use those minutes to talk about estimates, which are surrogates of true value. Um, the idea here is in practice, we don't know can't observe those true allelic effects that we keep talking about. Uh, we can't observe those true selection values, so we have to estimate them with the help of our biometricians. <laughs> um, and like any measure, those estimates of the individual's selection value, they deviate from the truth due to genetic and non-genetic factors both. Um, I'm not going to really go into too much detail about how to separate these. Christian will give a very detailed presentation on how to optimally do that. Um, so yeah, our observations of selection units are not their true value. So we measure, estimate, and we, we're going to call those surrogates of value. OK, that's, a, that's the word we've chosen. Different surrogates of value you can use. Um, so this is connecting, how do I measure these things you were talking about? Um, those could be a phenotype, just based on a single observation, a phenotypic mean, a best linear unbiased estimate, or a blue. 
best linear unbiased prediction or a blup. Um, and then you can also add pedigree information to blups or um, genomic information to those. Um, and when you add that genomic information, by the way, you can do it two different ways. You can use the marker genotypes directly and shrink them in a special way, um, which is called ridge regressed best linear unbiased prediction, RR blub. You can also use those markers to make a covariance matrix and put that into the model as well. That's called GBLUB. Um, under most conditions, these end up being equivalent. So when I was first reading papers, I was really confused because I didn't know they were the same thing. Uh, so uh, if you uh, run into these, keep in mind that most of the time, either approach is equivalent. You can even back solve from one to the other. Um, I think all surrogates can be used for most selection units. Um, some require information about relatedness, uh, so forth. So let's go through some of the pros and cons of each of these. This is just a refresher. Um, I know a lot of you know this way better than I do. Um, so when you think about a single phenotypic observation, what are we really seeing when we see the phenotypic value? Um, we're definitely seeing the, the true genetic value. It's in there. It can't escape because we're observing it. Um, and that's going to be comprised of, you know, additive value, dominance value, epistatic value, depending on the trait. But we also see the environment value, the G by E value, and random error. With a single observation, we're kind of stuck selecting on all of these at the same time. So um, this is uh, maybe a bit limited as far as a method of observation goes. Um, we can also think about a phenotypic mean in the same environment. And what I want to remind you is that the benefits of using means over single observations is this really cool ability to sort out the error in your measurements. So considering a single environment, again, um, we have here in blue each rep of a single genotype with a true genetic value of two, and we're showing its phenotype. The error that went into that phenotype, we know because we're making this up, um, is right here in red, or we simulated it, rather. Um, so if we take the phenotypic mean as we sequentially add reps, let's see how that mean changes, right? When we measure this individual, its phenotype is 3.3, right? That's pretty far from two, which is the truth, because we're seeing a lot of that error. As we add an observation, the error is random, okay? That's kind of the beauty. Like, the error is random, so we can't capture it, but the error is random, so it can't trick us. <laughs> um, so this has a different error. This one happens to be negative. Um, so it actually draws us nicely back to the true value of two. Uh, we sample again. Um, this next round uh, doesn't bring us that far in either direction, 2.7. We sample again, 2.2. And we eventually converge onto two, all right? So this is, of course, the concept of regression to the mean that we observe with normally, uh, normally distributed errors, um, which can be either positive or negative. And this is a big thing I want to remind you of because um, this is actually important when we use blups as well. It's this general idea that when we have error in an observation, uh, it tends to be random in any direction, so it will converge to that true signal, okay? Um, best linear unbiased estimates in same environments. Um, if you don't have missing data, your blues are just equivalent to your phenotypic means, okay? Um, but if you do have missing data, the blue can account for effects like blocking or other experimental design factors in a more sophisticated way, which is taking the marginal means of uh, the factors instead of taking a straight phenotype mean across all the factors. I'm sure you all know this. Um, I think this is the same as like ordinary least squares and things like that. So if we have a situation here where we have three different blocks and we measure five genotypes in them, wow, block one looks really nice. Looks really good, right? The thing is, I'm missing an observation of genotype two in block one. Genotype two only occurs in these other blocks that are not doing quite as well. So if I take a straight phenotypic mean on genotype two, when I compare it to these others that occur in all the blocks, it's not really getting a fair chance, right? Because uh, we just observed it in worse blocks. So using a blue can help you scrub out that information. And the other nice thing about this is that the mean of the block um, is maybe not as sensitive to the missing genotype as is the, the phenotypic mean, right? Because the mean of the block is 
you know, it's not that sensitive to which genotypes you put in it necessarily. All right, um, the next option is best linear unbiased prediction. Again, I'm going to assume the same environment. These are blups. Um, I think there's maybe a lot of mystery surrounding blups. We all use them, but here's the day where you might want to know what they are, okay? Um, we always predict something like a total genetic value or a breeding value, um, and we do it um, in a particular way. Uh, the idea of a blup is that you don't always have the same amount of information about all your genotypes, right? But we know that if we have more inc information, um, our estimates will tend to regress to a mean, okay? Some mean. So the blups uh, get ahead of this trend by sort of pre-shrinking your estimates based on an objective measure of how much information you have, okay? Isn't that interesting? Um, so here in this case, we have these genotypes. They're just measured in a random trial right now. And what we're going to actually do to get a blood, all we have to do is find the genetic variance compared to the error variance in this population. Okay? And then we're going to shrink our genotype's deviation from the overall mean by the ratio of that genetic variance to the genetic variance plus the error variance divided by the number of reps for a particular sample. Is this equation looking kind of familiar to you? Heritability, excellent, excellent. Oh my gosh, I'm so proud. Okay, so, <laughs> so yeah, you shrink it by the heritability. And the reason this is a good thing to shrink it by is that your heritability refers to the variance explained by all those genotypes. If you're missing one genotype, is your estimate of heritability gonna be drastically affected? No, it's gonna be all right, it's pretty stable. So your heritability tells you what you're drawing these observations from and how reliable those are on average. So you can say, ah, this lets me estimate how, how truthful my phenotypes are, and then I can shrink them by knowing I have that amount of information, plus one other little thing, um, which is the number of samples you actually have for a specific genotype. Like genotype three is missing information here. So we just add a little weight and pull that a little bit closer to its mean to know in advance that that's what we would see if we sampled further, okay? So this is a prediction of the value you're gonna get if you were to sample further. Um, is everyone comfortable using blups? Sometimes people are uncomfortable with the shrinkage because they want the values to be high, even if they're not truly so. Are you okay with blups? Any worries? Biometricians, do you feel like people uh, are comfortable using blups nowadays or? Yeah? All right, I know you all are, so not worried about that. I also wanted to say um, there was a nice blog from VSNI that like, made this, made sense for me. Yeah, so for example, uh, you know, this is many kind of trials we have um, not have balanced the data, so sometimes we have the genotype only in one or two environments, the others have more environments. Mm -hmm. So we are worried about uh, the the blood value for that environment might be shrink too much. Hmm. So do you think that's a, a concern or not? So if you're missing data in a particular environment, yeah. um, I don't know. Uh, what do you guys think? <laughs> oh, Eduardo didn't hear you. You want to grab the mic, Chef? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I sorry. question is mainly about the shrinking. So, for example, for our data sets, for certain genotypes, we have too much missing data. So, in total, we have 10 environments. But for certain genotypes, we only have two or three, or even one environment. So, that, the, blob, the blob estimation of that, that genotype, I worry about it. it might be shrink too much. It's not that accurate. Well, um, yeah, I, I get your concerns, um, but, well, actually, the strength of the PLUB and not um, um, a disadvantage because, because of the fact that you don't have enough data to get a good estimate, you're shrinking it. The shrinkage, basically, is your, your trust in the data you have. So if you test one genotype in 10 environments within your TPE, you put a lot of trust in that estimate. 
if you compare that to another genotype that you only test in one or two environments, you don't have a lot of trust. So this genotype might um, actually be really good and was tested in two average environments, and you're missing out. But on average, um, with your selections, you don't want to trust any genotype that doesn't provide you a lot of data. So obviously you will encounter a situation where your concerns are valid and you have a good genotype. It's not tested often enough and therefore you discard it. Um, but on average, it pays off to not put it more trust in it than the data actually suggests. So um, again, it is, well, I wouldn't say it isn't, it isn't it's, a, it's an issue of the testing rather than of the blub. Right. The blub gives you the best information than you, that you can get for selection. So if you encounter that situation, um, you shouldn't be bothered about the blub. You should be bothered about the testing approach and put this individual in more environments. Cecile? Is there a microphone close to for Cecile? Wait, wait, Maria, I'm close enough. Oh, thanks. I guess I'm going to have the same comment from Christian. I, 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 had, a, I had problem with blobs in a design that is an augmented design where uh, the block effect is controlled by some checks and then the blobs on my genotypes are all the same. So, like they're missing convergence of the model or something like that, I don't know. But I guess the viability among my checks in the various blocks is too strong. So this is where I, I encounter problems with blobs and then I always switch back to blues. So, and that's, I don't know how to deal with these issues. Well, from my perspective, that seems to be something more technical that probably the biometrician needs to look at. I don't think, again, that is uh, an issue with the, the blob methodology. Uh, it seems that if the experimental design is properly set up, you know, you have your augmented design, you have your checks, that should converge and, and you know, and get the blobs and depending on the genetic signal, of course, the shrinkage will be more or less. Um, but I would suggest that that, that, that might need some, that is something that we just need to look at, you know, probably uh, carefully. Uh, but uh, because, you know, even if you are in the blob model, and actually you're getting these issues, you know, basically that the model doesn't converge and, or that basically the genetic variance is zero, so the blobs is the same is zero or the same value. Even if you, I mean, you make the blue model and just say, okay, this is different, I'll use it. But that means that there's something wrong behind and, and you're just avoiding to look at the, the real issue uh, because the, the blob methodology should work. Um, so I cannot think immediately enough if the biometricians have encountered this issue. I haven't, I mean, I have encountered it the issue where the genetic variance for is zero, so basically all blobs are zero, but, but actually that's still a good thing. That means that there is only error in, those, uh, you know, in, in that particular experiment, and you cannot actually make selection out of it. And you make blues, okay, you get something, but like it's still, it's noise. The selection will not work. Um, but a particular, I mean, I, I cannot imagine a situation where actually the model gives you that the, all the individuals have the same blob. Um, I mean, it could be that the heritability is so low that, the, the, let's say, the, the difference is very, very small, which may, it might be that all the, all the blobs for all the genotypes is, let's say, 0.14 at the beginning of the number, but then the difference is 0 0.001, 0 0.0002. That can happen, but that's basically because the heritability is really, really low. So, um, again, as, as Kristen actually mentioned, that is a strength of the blob methodology because it's telling you that you're trying to select on noise. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, and just to briefly add on this, it is proven, it is statistically proven that the blobs are the best methodology to do our selection. Obviously, in later stages, when we compare our genotypes to, to checks in the field, we might need blobs because we can't compare them to shrunken values, um, at least not directly in, in the way you get your blob and your, your performance of the, of the check. But again, it's proven that the blob is the best methodology. And as Eduardo said, if you encounter something like you did, um, it's not the blob, there is another issue. And the blob tells you that there is an issue.
actually use the, the blobs to, to do the selection, but uh, sometimes we have to show the data to the people that's actually paying for it uh, in my program. And, and I try to avoid the blob because the, the value that they are going to see, it's, it's less than, than the real potential of the line. So they are going to say, okay, you are not doing right. It's just eight tons per hectare. And last time it, were, it was nine tons per hectare. So now what's the, the point? But I use the blobs <laughs> hidden from that to the, the selection. And also I have encountered for some of the, of the tests or the, um, the trials that, that we sent to the different uh, countries. Uh, Test uh, or trials that I'm not able to select by the blob because the heritability is too low. But even if we achieve around uh, 0.5 heritability, then it's it's easier, it's good to to do the selection. But the, yes, the the effect of the shrinkage it's it's there, but then I don't show it. <laughs> no, these are great comments, right? And I think the biometricians immediately recognize that this is probably what the, they are always asked. We don't like to see the mean zero, basically. I think that's the point. Um, and I think several of them, well, they have addressed that by just adding the intercept, which basically brings it to the original units. So you add the intercept, and then they look in tons per hectare, or, or in days to maturity, or in the original unit that was being asked for. But, but I guess that doesn't remove the fact that depending on the shrinkage, they might still not see that much variation. Um, and, and again, I want to bring this back because we're going to discuss it in the afternoon with the genetic gain. Just because the heritability is low, and you know, and the shrinkage is, let's say, a lot, I mean, that's as, as Christian and, and the rest of the intuition have said. I mean, this, this, that's still the best you, for selection, right? You have to accept it. But maybe the intercept was 10, and because the heritability is so low, everything moves between 10 and 11, right? So people is not comfortable, like, oh no, I have seen that they are like potentially 16 or 17 tons per hectare, but then in the blobs, I can only see between 11 and 9. Well, the heritability was low. Now, let, let's uh, make the difference. The, the blob is not, te is not telling you the genetic potential. It's not telling you that it can only yield 11 tons per hectare. It could actually yield more. But it's telling you that, you know, this is the genetic signal that we found in the experiment. And you should select over this variance that can be explained. So, so basically, you, you go and use uh, this blob, maybe the blob plus the intercept, you want to feel comfortable. But that doesn't mean that when you give your, the message to your donors or to the people that you work with, you don't have to tell them that this is the real genetic potential. You just have to explain them. Look, with the type of experiments that we run, this is the genetic signal that we were able to capture. And these are what we are using for selection. For you to see the real genetic potential, well, then you need to run you know, an experiment that is more robust. And you can use the blues for that particular purposes to say, you know, this, there is no shrinkage. And, but we are sure that we are removing the shrinkage methodology, but we are sure that we have put such a robust experiment that the heritability is really high. So this is a real or a, a, a good representation of the genetic potential. But if you were to do the same with a weak experiment, let's say that the heritability is really low and then you use the blues, then you're cheating yourself. That is not real genetics. But basically, if you say that something is between, you know, it can go up to 17, but the, the, the thing is that if you use that for selection, you're selecting over noise. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just the trade-off, right? And just to add one thing to that, um, I mean, this shouldn't become too technical now. And as Eduardo said, there are, um, there are situations where you want blobs and there are situations where you want blues. And that's why I also said, if you want to compare your your um, tested genotypes to your, to your reference checks, you wouldn't take the raw blobs because your reference checks have probably a couple of years of information, a lot of reliable information or accurate information, and, you're, and therefore they're not shrunken at all or not shrunken a lot. And your tested genotypes are, um, I don't know, maybe tested one or two years in the early stages. Therefore, they're have low, they have low heritability, they're shrunken a lot, and they will never outperform your check genotypes because of the shrinkage. But what's important to, to understand is the more data you collect, the higher your heritability gets, and that means the blob in the later stages approaches the blues, and they become more or less the same thing. 
Um, so it's really about the shrinkage and about the information. And when you have a lot of information, there's hardly any shrinkage and your blubs and your blues become the same thing. The blub, again, the heritability bit in the blubs or the shrinkage bit is just the trust you put in your data. And the more data you have, you, the more trust you put in it, and then it becomes finally more or less blue. In a practical way, it means that I can, okay, I usually use the blob for one trial with, I don't know, the true three checks uh, reply there, but it means that I can use uh, like a, as a database for the different trials and make just one calculation or you are adding information of the, of the checks, like more information of the, of the checks to the database that I'm going to, to do the analysis for the blob? How, how does? Well, I'm not sure if I, did yeah, you? I don't think I captured it. <laughs> <laughs> is that Christian is saying that, that we have been using the same check uh, for a lot of time, so it means that I'm going to do the analysis of my trial with information of the, of the check that I have been using for two or three years with that information of the two or three years uh, or five years evaluation or... or I, I would say for the, the discussing the check strategies and experimental design, maybe let's wait for the, the session that we have on that topic. For the, just for now, what we want to for you to keep this lesson is that, you know, BLOP is always the best methodology for selection. Might not, the be, might not be the best methodology to show something to your donors or, or you know, your, the organizations that you work with, with respect to the genetic potential. But when it comes to genetic signal selection, BLOP is the thing to use, well, is the best methodology. Uh, so maybe we can discuss that one maybe in the coffee break or also, you know, wait for the session on math and experimental design, etc. Yeah, let's wait for the coffee break. But just to repeat that, if you have a check in the field, you probably have a lot of information about that check, which means there's no shrinkage. And when you compare that check in early stages to new candidates which have little information, you will compare a check with no shrinkage to candidates with a lot of shrinkage. And that means even if the new candidates are better the shrinkage will have a very strong effect on them and they will never outperform the check. Um, therefore, at early stages where you have, again, a lot of information on the, on the check and little information on your candidates, you wouldn't compare the blub of the check to the blub of the candidates because the check blub has no shrinkage, the candidates have a lot of shrinkage. There is where you have to use blues then. So again, there is a reason for blubs and blues in different situations. But for pure selection, comparing individuals, comparing candidates at the same stage, the blub is the best strategy to go for. And again, does not mean that that individual or the, the testing material is not better than the check? It's just that with that methodology, because of the shrinkage that Christine has explained, you just cannot say it. Uh -huh. But don't think that the check is better. It's not. It might be that the genetic potential of one of the entries is is higher than the check. It's just the, the fact of the methodology. But again, as he said, you, you wouldn't do that comparison actually in early stages. If you're trying to do it at, at earlier stages, well, maybe then ask your biometrician to only consider one or the same level of replication from the check with the regular entries to, to, you know, to keep kind of the same, you know, put them in, in, in the same uh, uh, conditions somehow. Yeah, at least. is also we use the best, but also we try to use uh, the check the like intermediate level and the less. Because it's a manner example for resistant, we use a uh, high resistant, intermediate, and susceptible like a checks. Because we need to uh, uh, recognize very well our checks in, in depend of the trait we want to improve. So this is uh, important is when you need to evaluate uh, high spectrum of material. Because probably with one check, it's not enough for in order to, to think what happened in your population or in your, in your, our material. But this is a, we, 
usually use uh, the best, but in average, uh, five checks in depend on the trait. You no, know? but this is um, important to identify uh, what kind of material we are using in this process. Yeah, no, that's a good comment. But again, maybe let's keep that one for the session when we talk about experimental designs because it, it seems related, but actually it's kind of two different topics. Here we're just talking about, you know, the, the selection values, the surrogates of selection value. But yeah, this is a good point. Let's try to keep this in our minds when we move to that uh, discussion. Yeah, yeah, so if you have any, any more, like, statistical questions, let's move that to the coffee break. We also have a lot of biometricians here, so feel free to reach out to them, not only us, and, um, yeah, as Eduardo said, let's move on with the actual topic. Yeah, I'm also okay with moving on. But thank you for the great discussion. Um, we will be discussing checks in the afternoon and then also tomorrow. So there's plenty of time. All right. So discussing blips, you've all more or less brought the concept that it makes sense for the purpose of ranking genotypes to shrink them by the reliability of the information. And also the idea that we can weight things by how much information we have about it. I'm going to introduce to you one more idea, which is that we can weight things based on how related they are, based on how similar we expect them to be to another thing. Um, and this is the idea of using genetic relationships and covariances in BLUPs um, to get genomic predictions or pedigree predictions. Um, I don't know about you, but when I first started learning about genomic prediction, I definitely thought that somewhere out there, someone had like a dictionary of marker effects that everyone had but me. <laughs> and they were looking up the marker effect there and adding it up. But actually, um, your genetic relationships and everything are all still always fit to your phenotypes. Your phenotypes are always what produce the information about the marker effect, except in a case where you're doing something special with QTL. So, if you think about it, um, imagine we have three pairs of chickens here. These are identical twins. These are full siblings. And these are half siblings. Just knowing what you do about chickens, how much do you expect these to resemble each other genetic, uh, phenotypically based on what I've told you about them genetically? These are identical genetically. So you expect them to be identical phenotypically in absence of you know, error and other environmental issues. You expect these full sibling chickens to be, you know, sort of similar looking, but not as much as the identical ones, and the half sibling chickens to be even a little bit less. And if we want to get a little bit more specific, we can actually say, well, these chickens share all their alleles. They also share all of their pairs of alleles, okay? Uh, these chickens share um, half of their alleles because they both got a random half of the genome from each parent. Um, and believe it or not, they also share some pairs of alleles in common because they had the same parents, so by chance, sometimes they have the same pair of genotypes at a locus. And these chickens, uh, which are half-siblings, they don't share any parent, so they do share a quarter of their alleles, so you know, inbreeding, but they don't have any pairs of alleles together, all right? So based on that, you, you can see that based on the specific amount of alleles we expect them to share, um, we expect a specific amount of phenotypic resemblance, right? Um, it may not be perfect or anything like that, but there's a certain amount that is the same. Um, so when we have that expectation, we can formalize it as saying um, we have an expectation of their genetic covariance, right? So these identical chickens have a gen genetic kind of covariance of one, or an expected genetic covariance of one. Um, the full siblings, it's less than one. The half siblings, um, it's even less than the full siblings. So this general idea is, you know, the resemblance between relatives. And if we have that resemblance and we have an infinitesimal model of the alleles, the proportion of alleles individuals share is how similar we expect them to look. That's it. That's like the heart of genomic prediction, I would say. So we can be a little bit more formal about that and put them into a statistical model, all right? Um, so what we could do is say, Individuals' genetic relationships are going to lead to some degree of phenotypic resemblance based on either uh, the allele states that they share or the pairs of alleles that they share, the genotypes they share. Um, and so we estimate how much of those they actually share, either by a pedigree or by molecular markers, and then we put them in the model. Now, the key question is what happens when you have them in the model? They're basically just used as a, as a weight for their relative phenotypes. Okay, 
So if you have an individual's phenotype um, and you have an individual that is 50% related to it as well, this isn't exactly what happens, but basically you're going to say, this individual is half related to the individual I'm trying to predict. I'm going to multiply its estimated genetic value by 0.5 and use that <laughs> sort of in, in, the, in estimating what um, I think its relative would be. I don't really know the details of the math there, otherwise I'd give them to you. Um, so that's how it works when we use a genetic relationship matrix, like in GBLUB. Um, another thing you can do, like I said, is directly regress your phenotypes on those marker genotypes. That will give you each of those allelic effects, um, you know, shrunk into an appropriate value. Um, another nice thing about using relationship matrices is the previous methods we described are really good at, like, sorting out error or something like that but they actually can't partition additive and dominance values, which can at times be useful and helpful. This is actually an active area of research. It's sort of confusing statistically. Um, some of you might be interested in it because it has this problem where these things are not orthogonal, like by definition. So you may find that interesting to read about. Um, but the big deal for the purpose of selection is that you might need to separate out additive and dominance values. For example, if you're an early stage rice breeder selecting in a population that is not fully homozygous, you might want to treat that dominance value like error and make sure it doesn't get mixed into your additive value or something like that. Um, but like I said, we don't always have perfect ways to do that. Um, looking at what a relationship matrix would actually look like, like I said, if we have two genotypes um, and we want to look at their additive relationships, which are different, different from their dominance relationships, their relationship with themselves is like, in theory, going to be one. When you estimate it, it might not be exactly one. And then here, um, the two individuals have a, an additive relationship of 0.5. Like, they share half of their alleles by descent, and we estimate that from the pedigree, okay? And this is, these are the weights that would go into that model and get used somehow. If we have a genomic uh, relationship matrix, then we have actual marker genotypes. Um, and that would actually allow us to discern a little bit more clearly how related the two individuals are, even if they're, for example, half-siblings or a parent and child, because um, you have the actual marker scores. So you can take into account where the recombinations occurred and which one got which recombination, so you can account for Mendelian sampling. Um, so that's how this information gets used. Um, again, I, I, yeah. Yeah, can you please explain the difference of GBLAB and RBLAB? I'm not quite sure. Yes, sorry, yeah. And I don't really make it that clear here. Um, so you can do two different things um, when you make your model. Uh, you can say that my phenotype is a function of my um, genotypes, and I can also specify a covariance matrix for those genotypes based on the genetic information. And their covariance is like their uh, common alleles by descent, okay? So that's GBLUB. And then it uses those relationships as weights on everything. The other way to do it that is equivalent is R or BLUP, like you're saying. So then you say your phenotypes are a function of the actual marker genotype, like 0, 1, 2. And then you can add all those up for each individual to get their values. Yeah, a great question. And, and still, if that was not clear enough, Christian, when he talks about genomic prediction on the last day, he will provide yeah. a detailed explanation. Yeah, Christian with the will matrices, more detail yeah. for this. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry? Yes. Uh, so the, the GBLOP is like using BLOP. It's just that you're weighting the methodology by, the, by this relationship, by this relationship matrix, either the pedigree or, or the marker-based. So that those matrices that she's showing at the bottom will be put in the model because the BLOP methodology allows to put some sort of covariance matrices or matrices to weight the, the predictions. But again, if that's not clear enough, there will be an explanation on the, the last day. And also, as Chris mentioned, we have pretty good biometricians here in the, in the room in case you want to ask them during the coffee break. Yep. Yeah. The big idea to take here is just that, you know, genomic predictions are just a special type of a regression. They're not anything magical. Um, another thing that is a nice metaphor, I think, is that um, if you've done spatial modeling before, 
you are familiar with the idea that genotypes that are next to each other in a field are more likely to be similar to each other in their phenotype. This is just saying genotypes that are right next to each other genetically are more likely to be similar to each other. And then the mechanics are exactly the same. Okay? So just demystifying this, but I want to leave the rest to make sure we don't yeah, go into anything. All right. Thank you so much for your attention for so long. We're almost done. <laughs> um, so now let's put this together and say in words, what is a surrogate of true value when it's estimated? Like, how do we put this together? It really bothers me when people say, oh yeah, I estimated the bluffs. And then they like leave it at that, like the bluffs of what? <laughs> that confused me for so long. Typically it's implied that it's the breeding value, but um, nowadays we have many other values we might like to use. For example, of course there's a genomic estimated breeding value, all right? So the breeding value is the selection value, the genomic estimate is the surrogate, okay? You can have a total genetic value. Um, you could estimate this by blue, by blup, by gblup. You could have a pedigree estimated breeding value, pblup, um, a genomic estimated GCA, those are estimated by gblup, and um, a GCA in general, you could estimate by blue, by blup, pblup, gblup. So the estimation, the estimation method is different from the thing you estimate. I think the reason these were conflated is that we started with genomic estimated breeding values and like um, the, the breeding value was like always the thing predicted and it wasn't possible to tease out the breeding value. Well, you could do it with pedigrees, but in plant breeding we didn't typically do it until we had markers, so it just became a thing. Um, yeah, you can think on your own about um, other possible surrogates of true value. The last thing is just that the accuracies of any surrogate can vary. You already know this. Um, and the example we're going to use is individual phenotypes. Um, you guys are always already super clear on heritabilities. Um, this is just showing a true total genetic value in black, the observed phenotype in red, and then our measure of accuracy, which is the square root of this. And we see how, um, yeah, uh, depending on maybe our effort in the phenotyping or resources or, um, you know, microenvironmental micro variation, you just have different um, accuracies of these estimates. And, yeah, the, what those are with some of the other methods can depend on, like, um, other things, but they're not that important right now. The final point is that um, we have this idea of selection values and we have the idea of their surrogates. Um, the thing you actually select might not really literally reflect the selection value. So it's important that we keep specialized vocabulary to refer to the actual selection unit of recombination that's used for crossing. All right, um, so the selection unit probably has a defined genetic meaning and we can make a distinction to avoid confusion. So you might be actually selecting to make your cross an individual, which is pretty generic. Um, you could specify that you're selecting families, and that means that all individuals share at least one parent. So by saying it's a family, you've actually specified that it, they have a genetic relationship. Um, clones are heterozygous genotypes, and we specify that they can be multiplied identically. Lines are fully inbred, and an F1 hybrid is typically a cross of two different populations. So each of these words have specialized genetic meanings, and it's good, good to use them. For example, um, when I started here, I was new to clonal breeding, and I didn't know much about it. So I kept talking about breeding lines, and it made everyone very uncomfortable. <laughs> so now I'm careful to say clones instead of lines when I mean clones. All right, thank you for sticking through that. Thank you for your attention. And um, I think we're gonna move into the exercise, if that's okay. It'll be short. Any, any quick questions or follow-up? We will have a lot more time to follow up on these concepts in the other sessions, so, so don't worry. Can we have a quick five-minute break at least? Let me check. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, a five-minute break would be great. Please relax. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah.
All right. It's totally fine. We went over time for that conversation because um, the exercise is really short, so don't worry. Um, while you're sitting down, yeah, again, uh, this is a specific manual we have about estimating surrogates genetic value, if you want to see it. And we will talk about it much more anyway, so it's good. To do the exercise, um, if you could go into the day two of the um, drop, Dropbox folder. Does everyone have access to this? Could you raise your hand if you want any help? You're all good? OK. If you could open this file that says exercise, please, um, that would be great. No rush. Day two folder. So we used to, yeah, during this time, we used to just have general conversations with people about, um, you know, mapping their pipeline and looking for places to apply the breeder's equation. Um, but I think we, we just have pretty strong relationships with everyone here, so we already talked to you about that. <laughs> um, so we'll just do a quick exercise uh, using the breeder's equation. Um, this may be something you've done before. Um, but sometimes people, after going through all the math, they really want to use it right away. <laughs> so the example that you have here um, is a five-stage breeding program. Um, there's a stage of maybe clonal evaluation, an observational trial, a preliminary trial, an intermediate trial, and an advanced trial. And each of those stages have different heritabilities for the phenotypes. Okay. Um, so therefore, they have different accuracies. If you recycled at any of these stages, a given stage, you would have a different cycle length as well, right? Depending on the stage that you select from and use as parents, you have a different cycle length. So those are reflected here. I made up the intensity and the genetic standard deviation. We're gonna assume those are the same regardless of stage, no, no big deal. These are just made up for you. And what you will want to do, please, is to calculate um, genetic gain or response to selection. I think I copied the wrong files over this morning. I noticed that with the presentations, too. So I'm sorry about that, and I need to hunt down the right one. Let me check. Yeah, this is the wrong file. So if you'd like, you can just delete these for me real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I wonder where I put that. Anyway, I'm going to find that other file while we're working on this. But if you could please calculate the expected genetic gain that you would have uh, if you recycled at each of these stages in the breeding program. OK? You can use the PowerPoint or anything you want. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just do this first stage with you. Um, to get my accuracy, this is the only thing that I might need to calculate. I think I've given them to you here. That's going to be the square root of my broad sense heritability. We're going to assume a balanced trial. I drag and drop to get the rest of these. Like I said, that's not really a good use of your time, so I think they're given to you here. To get genetic gain, that's just going to be equal to your accuracy times your intensity times your genetic standard deviation. And all that needs to be divided by the cycle length. We're getting order of operations, so I'm going to put some parentheses there. So there's the first one. You can go ahead and do this for the rest of these. Um, and what I want you to think about here, um, because you've been given two other possible schemes as well that have different accuracies at different stages, is what is the optimal stage for each of these pipelines to recycle from, given this information? So your goal for each of these is to find which of the stages is best to recycle from, given the accuracy achievable at that stage and given the cycle length it implies. So you're going to need to pick CE, OT, PT, IT, AT, um, based on your calculation. So please go ahead and take 10 minutes to, for each of these, try to pick um, <clears throat> which stage you think is best to recycle from. You're welcome to talk or work in pairs, anything you want.
Okay. <clears throat> so let's just go through this first one together. Um, quick here, you could have just dragged and dropped these, of course, to get the expected response to selection out of each of these stages. And the maximum value here is actually at the OT. Did most, yeah, most people are nodding. That's great. Um, so this is kind of interesting because the OT doesn't have the highest accuracy of these stages, but it's faster, okay? Um, so next, let's see. Yeah, for this next one. Is everybody already done with this? Can you raise your hand if you finish the second one? Okay, take some time and see which one is best for this situation. Going to continue looking for the right file. All right, this is the file that I wanted. Okay, so completing the second um, possible pipeline, um, in this situation, we actually find that the maximum genetic gain or expected genetic gain occurs with recycling from the AT, the very last stage. All right, so that one does have a really high accuracy. And interestingly, that accuracy is enough to overcome recycling later, all right? Um, so if you're running a traditional phenotypic selection, um, uh, we'll, be talk we'll have a whole session about reducing cycling. Um, but keep in mind that there's a trade-off there between um, accuracy and the cycle length. Um, yeah, for this last one, let's go ahead and do the same thing. Let's wrap this up. All right, yeah. Um, and this one, you know, this is maybe more this is probably the most realistic of the heritabilities given, I'd say, in this scheme. We have a pretty steady increase, um, and we have really similar gain recycling from either the OT or the PT. We have a nice balance of accuracy and cycle length. Everyone's nodding, that's great. Um, so just one more big concept. You may have noticed that I always put the accuracy of the first stage to be zero here. That's because if you're all thinking with me, when you first generate your seedlings off of a single cross, most people don't have material to evaluate. And of course, before they're planted, you certainly, you know, before they're planted in the field, you can't evaluate them. Um, but if you have the capacity to predict, um, you can infer trait values before phenotyping. So even if those predictions are really low accuracy, let's say right here, point one, um, even a low accuracy prediction quickly can be better than a really good phenotype slowly. Okay, so I think that's maybe a key thing to think about with the breeder's equation. And there's a visual here that you can explore, um, again, with constant genetic variance and constant intensity over a range of possible accuracies and cycle lengths, um, just to kind of get a feel for that. But we will be talking um, more and more in depth about those in a later session. Okay, does any, any comments, any thoughts there? Okay, thank you for sticking it out through the morning. <laughs> this, was, this was a great group. You're right, I'm sorry. I'm gonna copy that over right now. <laughs> Thanks.
Okay, yeah, if no one has questions, um, Eduardo, do we need to do anything else? Well, I would say if there is any comments, thoughts, questions, uh, I mean, we stay for another 10 minutes. Otherwise, again, the, we go for, for lunch at 12.30, Rosalba. So basically, yeah, we're absorbing everything too fast compared to the rest of the groups. <laughs> so that's why we're finishing earlier uh, these sessions. I guess it made the difference that we were more than 40 people, so there was more comments and questions compared to only having the small group that we were planning for. Um, but yeah, let's try to stay until 12, trying to finish the, the exercises. If you have comments or questions, we will be around. Otherwise, we see you at 12.30 in the same place that was about yesterday. So, you know, just right outside next to the building, there will be a table where lunch will be served at 12.30. So, you're free to stay or relax or go to your room in case you want to pick something before lunchtime.